order. And by the way, commissioners, we are not actually mic, so um, maybe project your voices a little louder than normal. Um, but the audience can hear us <coughs> over the TV. Okay, but anyway, so for each case, there will be a public hearing. Uh, we ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal. So eight minutes, just remember to keep two minutes at the end. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they are representing an organization or a group and they may have five minutes. Um, first of all, I'd like to make a, 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 of our intern, uh, Ryan Charles, like to, to recognize him. I think he's been around for a while and I keep forgetting to do it, so we're doing it first thing on the agenda this time. So thanks I'm for being with us, Ryan. Uh, do I have a motion to approve last month's meeting minutes? So, so moved. moved. Second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carried. Uh, appeals to decision. Pursuant to the provision of section 2.680.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County via a statutory writ of certiorari. You're advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. So first thing is the consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. And um, so far we, ha we do have 1610 Cedar Lane that's removed and two, what is that, three, 311 West End Place, and that's it. This month's consent agenda. We approve minutes already, yeah. This month's consent agenda includes 1821 Fifth Avenue North, new construction of a detached accessory dwelling unit, 4028 Aberdeen Road, new construction of an addition, 2617 Essex Place, in addition, an outbuilding and setback determination, 1027 Mansfield Street, new construction of an addition with setback determination, 1504 Ordway, Place, new construction of an addition. 2125 Belmont Boulevard, new construction of an addition. 2213 Belmont Boulevard, an addition. 1403 Elmwood Avenue, uh, a detached accessory dwelling unit. 1405 Elmwood Avenue, a detached accessory dwelling unit. 1210 Ordway Place, new construction of a detached accessory dwelling unit. 1702 Ashwood Avenue, an outbuilding and setback determination. 608 Russell Street, an outbuilding with setback determination. Um, 122 South 12th Street, a new construction of an addition and outbuilding with setback determination. 2008 Benjamin Street, a detached accessory dwelling unit. 714 Russell Street, um, new construction of additions and a detached accessory dwelling unit. 1324 Stratford Avenue, an outbuilding and setback determination. 2119 Westwood Avenue, an addition outbuilding with setback determination. Uh, 3725 Central Avenue, uh, new construction of an addition. And 1322 Sixth Avenue North, new construction of appurten appurtenances. Staff has reviewed the items in the consent agenda and uh, has found that they meet the respective design guidelines and recommends their approval. Okay, thanks Paul. Any um, questions to Paul before he sits down? Okay, thanks Paul. Move to adopt. Well, let me do open here, public hearing. Open public hearing. Uh, would anybody like to speak uh, regarding any of these on the consent agenda? Seeing none, close public hearing. I move to adopt the consent agenda as presented. Okay, we have a second. All right, we have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. So the first one is 1610 Cedar Lane. Actually, we're going to start with 311 West End Place. Um, okay. So, uh, 311 West End Place. Sir, my apologies. All right. This is a request to construct an outbuilding that is not a detached accessory dwelling unit and includes both rear and left side setback determinations. Um, the outbuilding 
um, meets the design guidelines for everything except setbacks and eave height. Uh, the outbuilding is located at the rear of the lot with parking from the alley. The proposed footprint is 749 square feet. Since the outbuilding exceeds 700 square feet, um, the, the base zoning requires that the rear setback be 20 feet and the side setback be five feet. The applicant has requested to reduce uh, the rear and the left side setback both to three feet. Staff does recommend approval of the, both setback determinations, finding that they are appropriate as outbuildings were historically located close to or even on the, the rear and side property lines. Uh, in addition, uh, this structure is not um, a DADU, so it will not include um, an additional dwelling unit. And also, while the garage is accessed from the alley, the garage doors will actually face the right property line, so they will not open directly onto the al alley. So the overall height of the proposed building is 21 feet with an average eave height of 14 feet 6 inches. Uh, since the outbuilding is an accessory structure, it should be subordinate to the house. As proposed, the outbuilding is two stories, whereas the house is one and a half stories. Um, the outbuilding exceeds the average eave height of the house um, by one feet, one foot, three inches. Um, as an accessory structure, as stated before, it should be subordinate to the house, not only with regard to the footprint and the overall height, but also with regard to eave height. Um, so staff recommends um, that the average eave height of the outbuilding not exceed that of the historic house. So here we have the elevations, the front, which will face the house, the left side, um, the alley, and the right side, um, which will have the garage doors. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the outbuilding and setback determinations with conditions, including the condition that the average eave height of the outbuilding not exceed the average eave height of the historic home. Okay, thank you. Any questions for staff? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would the applicant like to come forward and um, state, your, state your name and address? in line with the that of the existing house due to site conditions of slope. Um, I'm going to give staff this, which has a limited line, which comes from the And so that is, that is the condition that we base the eave height of the proposed garage structure on, where it's not in excess of the height of the eave of the existing house due to the slope of the grade going toward the rear of the property. Um, that's, that's, we would like to have that, it makes, because of the low slope of the roof that we are matching the existing houses roof pitches, it makes that the, the law space a little bit more workable, and we also feel it is deferential to the house because of the site, the site, so. You see on the, on the uh, image I passed to you a line truck from the eave of the existing house straight across based on grade and everything else. We'd like to like appreciate your consideration about that. Um, we'd certainly uh, be pleased to answer any questions. Okay, any questions to the applicant at this time? Okay, thanks a lot. Maybe, maybe we can use your rebuttal if you need to at the end, depending on public hearing. Okay, open public hearing. Would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Okay, seeing no public hearing. <laughs> any, any questions come up at all? I guess I, I do have one question. Uh, that, the, reducing that one foot, uh, how does that adjust the ceiling height? I guess it would probably be the adjustment at the top floor. Correct, correct. And we have compressed the, the garage level as much as we possibly can to give clearances for those garage doors and things like that. It just makes our e, our e bearing really tight trying to make a stair work within that footprint. We, get, we start banging our heads against it. 
Well, uh, but I mean, can you, do you have a height that, that would that reduction would be the upper level ceiling height, floor to ceiling height? It would reduce the upper level floor to ceiling height below eight feet if below we reduced feet. it to 13 I mean, foot. is it closer to seven or seven and it's, a half? It's right at eight feet right now. That's, we kind of based all that, looked at where eave, roof, roof eaves were, lined them up, and worked, in, worked inward from that. All right, no more questions. Thanks a lot, Ben. Okay, close public hearing discussion. I guess I have reservations on making those exceptions just because these outbuildings become such a, uh, they, they tend to get bigger, and, and although this is not. Um, I, I certainly see that, that the elevation uh, is such that it would be lower. Uh, but if we were to pass it, we need to make sure that we've made that exception that, that we took into consideration the grain within the motion. I agree with Dan that uh, the combination of the saloon providing some flexibility along with the overall ridge height being relatively low makes it possible to bring the eaves up that high. I think they're stretching the very limit of it, but I think they've found as far as it can go. For me, with sort of an exception, not an exception, but as far as we can bend on, on the relative eave heights versus the, uh, the main house versus the uh, uh, outbuilding. It, it's staff, uh, <coughs> our I mean, are, are, are you comfortable? I mean, is is there actually that drop in elevation from front to back such that we could? I mean, that there, we're there definitely is a change in elevation. I think our reservation was that um, while this isn't a dad room, um, there were um, some other elements that, that we were more flexible with. For example, the the dormer. that's proposed typically that would have to be inset from the wall below in this case it's a, a wall dormer uh, which pretty much says no but because it's not a daddy you know we, we made an argument for since it's facing the alley um, and it doesn't have to meet those daddy standards so I think that was our thinking well there are some things that are flexible in this case, you have a one and a half story house and a two story daddy with a two story eave height. So what you're saying, I mean, is that you all made the concessions where you felt that we they were least impact us making an exception? Uh, no, because uh, there's, there's the other issue too. The grade drops and you make the argument that allows for more height, then what, what about when the grade rises? Does that then squish a building down? Well, I so, so there's that concern, and as you all know, we're, we've been trying to be very, very, very consistent with garages as well as outbuildings so that applicants know what to expect when they come here, they know what to expect when they're designing, and the concern is that just as soon as we start to open doors, then where, then where are the rules? What are the rules? What are we passing along to applicants? How are we helping them design them? Well, I will say that I think you, taking advantage of a, a drop in grade, it doesn't necessarily follow that we need to uh, reduce the height foot for foot with uh, an increase in grade. I think we can treat them separately. It can be a one-way street or sort of a different scale um, depending on a, a drop in grade or a, uh, a rise in grade. I think if the um, if the motion were crafted to uh, insert that um, fact that applies here, that um, it goes down and therefore uh, the grade goes down from the main house, uh, that is a a difference for us that we are not going to create a precedent here. We've carved out a distinction. That's how I see it. 
just, I guess we just have to be careful with that, just as um, a staff brought up, just that we, however we proceed on it, that we just realize that uh, there's been a lot to deal with outbuildings that we deal with, so just I was so consider that. Even if our commission isn't um, purview over use, and at this point it's an outbuilding versus a DADU, and our, our board has been, um, you know, we're very strict on how the DADU uh, follows guidelines because of all the um, efforts and things that the neighbors have gone through. So in past, you know, we've heard of a, uh, an example where it was a outbuilding at one point and then it became a DADU. So then it, in the DADU requirements today, it was not un, in requi under requirement. I mean, under, um, if you follow on saying this, so then if it does become a DADU in the future, then are we setting precedents for that possible use in the future, that it's not um, following those guidelines? I don't think that we are setting precedents. I don't think this would be, if, if we were to approve this, I don't think that that is precedent or allows any sort of argument that a DADU could do this. The DADU has its own much more rigid standard. If somebody decides later that they're going to illegally turn it into a DADU and use it, it's a codes issue and not really ours. I think we should be cognizant of that potential like you're saying, but I don't think a change in use later sets up an argument for someone to say, well, there's this DADU here because the way we approve it is it's an outbuilding, it's not an ad I think, it, at least for our purposes, it's apples and oranges, at least technically. I will say that, you know, this issue comes up every month and we struggle with it every month. Everybody wants a little more. And I did do a little research and for the past six months at least, that's as far back as I had time to look at, you have not strayed, whether it's an outbuilding or a DADU, from those requirements that were that you agreed you wanted to uphold. And you do have another case coming up later today where the councilman has asked you to stay the course with those requirements. So I just wanted to point that out. Is, can you clarify that <clears throat> the requirement in the staff's recommendation for approval with the measurements of average height is, where does that, fall out of the guidelines or the direction that, we, that, that the staff and or that the commission has taken to, um, to, to evaluate these? I will say that we've always looked at the average um, eve height and ridge height at all four corners of the existing house to determine yeah. if that is, but I think you're asking more than that. Yeah, and I'm, if you could clarify, I'm a little confused as to what you're I, I looking think for. There's, I, what I'm hearing is that there's some um, reaching for trying to allow this to happen. And if we're gonna do that, it needs to reference the guidelines, or if you're not gonna, if you, if you wanna take a position that you're not gonna do it, I think referencing, talking about is it subordinate or is it not subordinate, raising the, you know, the, the ridge height makes it one of these things, we're, we're arguing in degrees of, of, of what that is as opposed to discussions about setting precedents or other things like that. If, if it's within the guidelines, you know, it, it is, or, or make an argument for that. If it's not, then, then or, or you feel that it is, and it maybe has been judged to not be, make an argument for that. Robin, the, the six month look back that you did, are, are you saying that over those, if, make sure I'm understanding the point, are you saying that over that six months, this commission has said, regardless of whether it's a DADU or an outbuilding, the use, is not relevant. We're treating our guidelines, our interpretation of the guidelines for outbuildings have stuck to the, the stricter DADU standards, yeah. so we're not getting in the middle of what do they do with it. A few but, years ago, <clears throat> some of you may remember that we started hearing from neighborhoods quite a bit, really concerned that garages and additions and infill and everything were just getting too big. And so we received multiple public input about that at the meetings, outside of the meetings. You've probably met with people after public hearings and, and heard you know, concerns. At least that's what I've heard back from you. Um, so then we had a series of charrettes. And one of the things that came out of that was it would be so much easier on the applicants if they were the same, if the regulations for dad use now buildings are the same. 
So you added that as italicized information into the design guidelines that you would look at them both in the same way. And that is what you have stuck with, I think, since then. But again, I've only had an opportunity to really research the last six months. Does that help? So the, the guidelines themselves have not changed. That talks about outbuildings being appropriately scaled and massed for the neighborhood, for you know, in terms of other outbuildings, in terms of how they relate to the historic buildings. And so that italicized information is your evaluation of how you are going to, or information as to how you're going to evaluate that section of the design guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. So let's just clarify, let me just understand this. So the eave height of the proposed garage or outbuilding is how much higher than the primary house? One foot three inches. Okay. Thank you. I can reopen public hearing real quick. Did you have a really quick comment, Van? So just for the commissioners to know, this property, even though it exists in a historic, uh, a conservation overlay, this pro the properties on this street are zoned RS, so a DADU isn't actually possible. That is one reason we don't have a DADU proposed. <laughs> Um, the other thing is the, the guidelines, even with the italicized comments, your basic guidelines say a maximum eave height of 17 and a half feet and a maximum ridge height of 25 feet. Obviously that does not apply across every situation as this, as this represents. It does ask for the building to be subordinate in massing and so forth to the, to the structure. Um, that is where we stand on this is that this building, because its eave does not exceed the eave height of the existing structures, which is uphill, it is, and its roof is not higher than the roof of the existing historic structure, not the addition, the historic structure, which you can see the addition was added, I, best, I guess five years ago, I can't remember exactly. Um, that's our position, it, is, it remains subordinate to the historic structure, and, and that's where we come from. We did work with staff. I mean, our first proposal, our owners wanted eight foot flat ceilings on the roof, and we have worked between all those things. It's not been something that we've just thrown out and said, this is it. Okay. I appreciate well, your time. While the applicant's up, any more questions for the applicant? Okay, thanks. Close public hearing. Any more discussion, or do we have a motion? Uh, just, I'm still on the fence here, but I, I, I see the value and the, uh, the ability to be perfectly consistent if we just follow the, the DADU uh, dimensions and guidelines because it makes it mechanical. But there's a big part of me that says that's what codes do, does and that's why we have these bad results because it doesn't take context into, um, into account. And here I think when you look at it on paper, I know I'm looking at it on paper not on site, but it's very subordinate and I think meets the spirit of what the guidelines were intending to accomplish. It also, approving it, as Robin I think is making a very good point, it opens up a can of worms in a Pandora's box. So I guess it's up to us whether we think we can make those judgment calls and it's going to make staff's life a lot harder. It's going to mean people are going to push the envelope more. <coughs> But when I'm looking at this project, it looks good and fine and meets the spirit of the guidelines. So I guess we decide whether we want to keep that door closed or go for what I think might be a more equitable result. That's also a can of worms. <laughs> that is good. <clears throat> Anyone else have any more comments? Well, why don't you craft up a motion and let's... Uh... Well, I don't know if I want to open up the can of worms or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could... See what the rest of the uh, commission feels. I'll try very carefully. Uh, in lieu of the fact that the, uh, the overall structure is subordinate to, well, in light of the fact that the overall structure is subordinate to the uh, historic home and overall massing, the significant grade change uh, that further reduces uh, the perceived eave height um, 
and the fact that the average, while not perfectly consistent or less than the average EAP height of the historic home, uh, it is a very small amount above I think that uh, in context it meets the spirit of the guidelines to be subordinate, which is the biggest point to me for outbuildings. Uh, I move approval of the, uh, the application. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Because <laughs> we, we got to have at least two. <laughs> okay, all opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay, so motion does not carry. Um, so with that, somebody can craft. I'll try paper. another motion. Okay. Where is the paper now? Fortunately, I didn't get to print this one out. Okay, so with regard to the application at 1610 Cedar Lane, no, I'm sorry. Which one am I on? 311 West 311 West 10. 10. Oh, on the next page. <laughs> okay. Sorry. It's okay. I did not get to print all of these out. Um, it's the, yeah, it's the West End. All right, let's see if I can get going here. Uh, with respect to the application um, regarding 311 West End Place, uh, I move... Um, that the application be approved subject to the conditions set forth by uh, the staff. Okay. We have, a, second. we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. So now are we ready for 1610? Okay. 1610 Cedar Lane. 1610 Cedar Lane is an application for an outbuilding. The agenda was published saying it was an outbuilding and a setback determination, but prior to writing the um, staff recommendation, we received revised drawings that reduced the footprint of the proposed outbuilding so that it no longer needs a setback determination. So uh, this application is for an outbuilding that meets all the base zoning setbacks. Um, <clears throat> you can see it here on the site. Um, it's at the, the site in question is at the corner of Cedar Lane and Oakland Avenue. The proposed outbuilding, which um, the applicant is saying will not be used as a dadu, is located behind the historic structure. It will be three feet from the rear property line and um, well over five feet from the two other side property lines. The total square footage for the footprint will be 690 square feet. <clears throat> here is um, here are the um, two elevations. Uh, the elevation. Oh, let me just go back one um, moment. The um, there is no alley for the site, so the garage will be accessed via an existing curb cut off of Oakland Avenue and Side Street, which staff finds to be appropriate. Um, so the uh, facade on the uh, left is the West or Oakland Avenue facing facade and um, the one on the right is the um, house facing facade. Um, this lot has a fairly substantial slope from, I don't know if I know northeast, but from like from Oakland Avenue to the interior of the block, there's a fairly substantial drop in grade. So in this instance, um, well, I'll just go through and um, get to this. Um, so he, this is the Oakland Avenue facing facades. Um, so um, I'm sorry. Find the eave height in this um, case will be 16 feet, which is um, less than the maximum um, eave height, and the ridge height will be 25 feet. Um, both of these are subordinate to the historic house. When you get to the interior facade, the eave height and ridge height relative to the grade does increase because of the substantial uh, increase to, uh, because of the substantial slope to the lot. But staff found that because the street facing facade, which will be the most prominent facade, um, does meet the, the eave height and the ridge height and is well subordinate to the house that it met the design guidelines. Um, the materials. Materials from brick, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, I think the material will be lap siding or brick. I might have to get the applicant. 
confirm that. Uh, I think yeah, it'll be brick with a asphalt single shingle roof and staff will ask to review all the window choices. So in conclusion, staff is recommending approval of the outbuilding um, with the conditions that staff approve a brick sample, um, staff approve all window doors prior to purchasing the installation, and staff approve the shingle color. All right, thanks. Uh, any questions, Melissa? Okay, thanks, Melissa. Uh, would the applicant like to come forward and <laughs> state your name and address? Dan Pond, 2929 Sidco Drive, 37204. Um, we worked with staff to make this compliant with setbacks. We presented this to staff a couple of weeks before the deadline, talked to them about what needed to happen, uh, did that. We are here to answer any questions that you all have, and we appreciate your time. Any questions for the applicant? You agree with staff recommendations? Do you yes. agree with staff yes. recommendations? Yes. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, open public hearing. Would someone like to speak regarding this project? Yep, yeah, please come forward and state your name and address. Uh, my name is David Tarpley. I live at 2814 Oakland Avenue. Uh, I'm appearing on behalf of uh, myself and my wife, Sarah. Uh, I did prepare uh, a presentation. Uh, Ms. Blaylock has one copy. I have two more I'd like to share, if I could, with members of the commission. Uh, just give it to Ms. Blaylock right. and she will... Um... Uh, did I understand, Ms. Blaylock, correctly that uh, the proposal has been changed so that the footprint is now less than 700 feet? Uh, yes, so now the footprint is 690 square feet. So the only notice we received in writing was the notice saying that the footprint exceeded 700 feet, therefore a variance would be required on the setback. Uh, which would otherwise be a 20-foot minimum. Yeah. Um, I just wanted stated for the record that we received no notice that there has been a change in that proposed setback. And I'm here uh, to discuss the setback on behalf of myself and my wife. My testimony is printed verbatim on the presentation you have. I'm going to go ahead and read it, please. My name is David Tarpley. My wife, Sarah, and I have owned and resided at 2814 Oakland Avenue since 1992. The south side of our property abuts the rear of the Christmas property. That side of our house is the active side, containing our living room, dining room, kitchen, and den, where most of our day-to-day -day living occurs. Its windows have the best view, including a view of the green area where my wife loves to feed birds. This side of the house also has the best light, the proposed three-foot setback threatens a tree which may be on the property line. Furthermore, it will reduce light to the area, which could be a factor when we landscape to offset the removal of trees during construction, which, by the way, we plan to do. A setback of 10 feet would pose no hardship to the property owners and would alleviate, to some extent, the loss of enjoyment of our property that a three-foot setback would cause. This is not a situation where there is an alley that would provide a buffer beyond the setback. The 10-foot setback would allow the Grissoms to build their garage studio and would also allow us to continue to enjoy our side yard. My wife and I requested the commission disapprove the three-foot setback. And with that printed testimony are some exhibits, overhead shots of both residences together, an aerial photo of that side, that is the south side of our home, showing the windows I've just alluded to, uh, a portion of our survey done in March 2012 showing uh, as best we could draw it in where the accessory building would be with a three-foot setback. Uh, the provisions of the Metro Code outlining the requirements for a variance. And uh, a large tree that may be on the property line. It's impossible to determine for sure right now because of the undergrowth. Uh, one taken from the first floor dining room window and one from our upstairs bedroom window. Again, all of this was prepared based upon the only notice we had, and that was that a variance from the 20-foot setback to the 3-foot would be required for approval by this board. Um, however, I am presenting it for your consideration. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak regarding this project? Okay. Close public hearing. 
discussion? Could you just, um, yeah, do you mind yeah. clarifying that again? Thank you. The setbacks have not changed in the proposal from the initial um, version that we saw. So the initial version uh, had a footprint that was over 700 square feet. And base zoning requires when a outbuilding has a footprint of over 700 square feet that it be pushed 20 feet from the rear property line. Um, so therefore, you, it would need a setback determination. Um, with that version, the applicant sent out notices to all the adjacent property owners, which is typically required when we when we consider a setback determination. After that was done, um, we did hear some concerns from neighbors. We spoke to the applicant, and the applicant agreed to reduce the footprint of the structure to less than 700 square feet, uh, 690 square feet. Um, and in that case, the base zoning setbacks are three feet from the rear property line, and, and um, I think it's like five or 20 from Oakland Avenue and only um, three feet from the interior property line. Um, so it's more than meeting the side setbacks. It is also meeting the three foot rear setback. Now, if it was more than 700 square feet in footprint, it would need to be under base zoning pushed 20 feet from the rear property line. But because it was changed to be less than 700 square feet, the three foot setback does meet the base zoning setbacks. Okay. So and we're not making a setback ruling. So yeah, so this proposal that's before you right now, um, and that is the, the version that was in your staff recommendation, okay. uh, does not require setback determination. Okay. It, it just is, not that it's gonna, I, I don't think it's dramatic, but the footprint of the outbuilding that changed by, what, 10 square feet? It was a little bit more than that. Basically, it didn't change the dimensions. No, um, what happened was originally there was a front porch um, attached to where the kind of overhang is now, uh -huh. um, and we count porches as part of the footprint calculation. What the applicant did was um, remove the porch and put the hood over, and when it doesn't have posts that go to the ground, we don't count it as part of the footprint. So it was a removal of the porch that reduced it to the less than 700 square feet. The dimensions, the height, the eave height. Footprints. Footprint, the yeah, pretty, yeah, the footprint's pretty much the same as if the, the porch was removed. Um, and, and just so, because um, I know the, the audio isn't necessarily great, so, so because this faces Oakland Avenue, the house on the other side facing Oakland Avenue, I mean, that's this, the, the rear yard for this house is the side yard for the house next behind it. All right, any more questions for staff? Okay, thank you. Discussion, motion? I mean, it looks to me like the house is in compliance and we're not granting or in the position to grant any deviation from what the regulations call for. The applicant's not asking for deviation from the regulations. So I would move that in the matter of 1610 Cedar Lane that we uh, approve with the staff recommendations. Have second. A, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Abstain. <coughs> Abstain. Okay. Motion carries with one abstination. Okay. I wanted to say why I abstain. I oh, probably you don't have should. To. Okay. You, you don't have to. Right. Just abstain. Good. Thank you. Um, okay. So we're ready for 400 Broadway. Um, by the way, are, who's keeping time? Are you still keeping time? Okay. Broadway is an application to construct a rear and rooftop addition, to alter the historic and non-historic windows, to alter window openings on the rear facade, and to alter the storefronts. A little bit of background on the building. The building is located at the corner, the northwest corner of 4th Avenue North and Broadway. The building was originally constructed circa 1870, although the western portion of the stru structure, or the left part of the structure, was altered in the mid to 20th century with new window openings and steel windows. Both the 1870s and the mid 20th century portions of the building contribute to the historic character of the Broadway Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. So even though the um, left portion of the structure was altered, it was altered long ago, long enough ago that we consider it to be um, a historic alteration and something that is worthy of preservation. 
There are many parts to this project, so I'm going to start with the rooftop addition. The bulk of the addition is set back from the Broadway facade by the required 30 feet and from the 4th Avenue facade by the required 20 feet. However, a portion of the stair bulkhead encroaches on the 30-foot setback by approximately 8 feet. This stair bulkhead is no taller than 5 feet and is slanted so that the tallest portion of the bulkhead is further back and therefore less visible. The bulkhead will likely be at most minimally visible and the staff therefore finds that its encroachment into the setback um, to the required setback is appropriate. The design guidelines require that rooftop additions be a maximum of 15 feet above the parapet wall. This addition will extend 13 feet above the parapet wall along the Broadway facade on the image on the left. Because of the parapet wall steps down along the 4th Avenue facade, a back, portion of the the, a back portion of the addition will be 16 feet taller than that portion of the parapet. Staff finds this to be appropriate because the majority of the addition will be less than the required 15 feet, and because the portion of the addition that extends taller because of the lower parapet is pushed to the rear where it will be less, where it will be less visible. The addition's materials include an aluminum storefront system with fully operational glass wall system that's also known as a nano wall system, and the commission has approved this on new construction in the Broadway district in the past. Portions of the addition will be clad in an exterior cement composite facade system, and I do have a um, sample which I'll pass around along with the brochure. Uh, this is not a, a material that we've approved yet so far in the district. Um, staff finds that it could be appropriate, but we just want more information about how it's going to be hung on the facade. The applicant is proposing to install a railing on the roof. The design guidelines require that railings be set back eight feet from the parapet wall. However, along the Broadway facade, the railing will not extend above the line of the parapet, and therefore it does not need to be recessed eight feet as is typically required. The applicant has proposed the railing to be set at the parapet, which, else, which is appropriate in this instance. So along Broadway, because of the tall parapet, you won't be able to see the railing. It's set entirely below the um, parapet. Along 4th Avenue North, the applicant is also proposing not to reset the railing eight feet as is typically required. <clears throat> on this facade, the parapet drops in height and therefore between one and three feet of the railing does extend above the parapet line. <coughs> For this reason, staff is asking that the railing along the 4th Avenue facade be set back four feet, which is about, which is less than what is typically required, um, four feet rather than eight feet, just to reduce its visibility um, along that facade. The project also involves a rear addition. Um, again, the rear addition will be clad in that material that's being passed around. Um, you know, staff finds that the rear addition, it's on a rear facade, which is not a historically um, significant facade. Um, it's offset so that um, the corner of the historic building remains. Um, so staff finds that the rear addition is appropriate. Um, on this facade, the staff is, uh, the applicant is proposing to um, install a new window opening. Uh, it's that window opening there in the middle. Um, let's see. Oh. Yeah, so here it is. Um, here's a photo of the rear facade in the window opening that's proposed. Um, it also will have a nano wall system or a folding glass wall system. Uh, again, because this is a non historic facade, um, you know, and if there's a parking lot behind it, so currently it's visible, but you know, in the future that, that parking lot could be developed and um, the, the visibility would be reduced. Um, for those reasons, staff finds that um, this new window opening is appropriate. Now on to the storefront alterations. The applicant plans to alter the storefronts on both portions of the building. The storefronts are not historic, but date to a 1990 renovation of the structure. Uh, and this was prior to the creation of the Broadway Historic Preservation Overlay. So the renovation that was done in 1990 did not come before the Historic Zoning Commission. On the right portion of the building at the corner of Broadway and 4th Avenue North, the applicant is retaining most of the architecture of the storefront, keeping the corner entry. The primary change will be replacing the fixed glass in the storefront windows with an operating folding glass wall system, also known as a nano wall system. The commission has approved operable storefront windows like these on non-historic storefronts in the past, and staff therefore, therefore finds it to be appropriate. And just quickly, here's the um, Fourth Avenue storefront facade. 
There will be a separation between the left and the right storefronts since historically these were two separate buildings with separate storefronts. On the left portion of the building, the applicant intends to remove the entire storefront and rebuild a new storefront. The storefront will have a similar design to the storefront to the right, but will be simpler in design to match the mid-century design of the building. The entry will be located, the entry to the building will be relocated from the center to the left side of the storefront. Um, it, it will be recessed. Storefront windows will also be fully operational folding glass wall system. Uh, staff finds all of these changes to the storefront to be appropriate because, again, the storefront is not historic. It was constructed in 1990. You can see on the drawing that the applicant is proposing quite a few gooseneck lamps at the storefront. In total, 10 gooseneck lamps are proposed for the Broadway facade, one is proposed for the corner, and seven more are proposed for the 4th Avenue North facade. There are, are a total of 18 gooseneck lamps proposed for this storefront. The design guidelines state, quote, if, light, if lighting is installed, it should be concealed or simple and and as unobtrusive in nature, in, in design materials in relationship to other facade and elevation elements. Although the commission has approved gooseneck lighting for signage in the past, staff finds that the number of light fixtures does not meet the design guidelines because it is, quote, not simple or unobtrusive. Late last week, after the staff recommendations were published, um, we did get some more materials from the architects um, to further explain their lighting plan. Uh, the gooseneck lamps are proposed to shine straight down to the sidewalk rather than inward towards the building. Under the storefront cornice, the exposed, exposed bulbs are planned to run continuously along the storefront, shining down to illuminate the sidewalk. Also, a continuous line of lights are proposed for the top of the cornice shining up. While spotlighting that highlights architectural fe features of a historic building can be appropriate, a continuous line of lights that create a glow above the cornice is not. And just quickly, here's a snapshot of our design guideline page for lighting. You can see it shows um, specifically a gooseneck lamp and it states that the inward direction of the light um, is appropriate. So um, it kind of shows what an appropriate gooseneck light should look like. And it also you know, talks about um, that lighting should be concealed, simple and unintrusive. Um, light should be directed towards the fa facade rather than outwards. Um, and that spotlighting can be appropriate, um, but visible fluorescent bulbs are not. Let's see. Sorry, lost my place here. Uh, okay, so in order to meet the design guidelines, staff recommends that one gooseneck lamp be installed per storefront bay, which will reduce the total number of lamps to eight. So I just kind of showed with X's kind of generally what we mean. So for each bay, there would be one light. Um, obviously, they could move those around slightly, but that was kind of a general idea of what we were thinking in terms of appropriate number of lights. Uh, staff also recommends that the downward exposed bombs underneath the storefront corner be disapproved and the upward facing lights only highlight architectural features. Um, so for instance, you know, um, just lighting kind of in between the window bays would be something that would be an appropriate amount of facade lighting. Um, similarly on the rooftop addition, there's a quite a bit of lighting that is proposed. Um, so staff recommends for the um, rooftop addition, again, that only one gooseneck lamp be installed per storefront bay, which will reduce the total number of lamps on the uh, rooftop addition to eight. Staff also recommends that the downward exposed bulbs underneath this, oh, wait a minute. Um, it, um, the applicants can probably um, explain better. It wasn't clear from what they submitted whether or not they're proposing kind of those other downward light bulbs and the upward lighting on the rooftop addition as well. but. You know, again, it would be similar to what we recommend for the storefront, that the lighting, um, you know, be minimal in, in light architectural features. So now on to the proposed alterations to the windows. Um, so on the left part of the facade, the multi-light steel windows um, are historic, um, and they do date to the mid-20th century. Uh, you know, although they're not the original windows here, staff finds that they have acquired a significance of their own and are considered to be a contributing element to the historic building. Um, in 1990, during the renovation, the um, steel frames of the windows were 
restored and new glass was put in, new glazing was put in, um, so the, the frames are historic, the glazing has been replaced. The applicant is proposing to retain the existing steel frames and to reglaze the historic windows. Historically, steel windows like this one would have been fixed along the edges and would have had a center, central hopper window that could swing in or out, and you can kind of see the outline of those in the photo. Rather than restoring this historic operation, the applicant is proposing to retrofit the frame so that the entire window becomes an awning window. The windows would, would swing out horizontally to be perpendicular to the building facade when fully opened, and you can see that in the um, drawing on the left, that when it's fully opened, it would be perpendicular to the facade. Uh, when fully opened, the window would extend about four feet, eight inches beyond the building facade, completely changing the look of the building. Staff finds a proposed alteration to the window operation to be inappropriate. The operation of a window is intri intrinsically linked to its design and to the, to the historic building's design and to the overall look of a building. Retrofitting a historic window to operate as an awning window could require a change to the window frame or opening that would not be appropriate. Even if the window frames or openings are not altered, changing the operation of the window to be an awning window would inappropriately change the look of the upper stories of the facade. Now um, on to the other, um, to the windows on the right and 4th Avenue uh, part of the facade. Um, the double home windows on the 4th Avenue North facade and the right portion of the Broadway facade are not historic. They were installed during the 1990 renovation of the building. Um, but the historic photograph seems to indicate that, you know, uh, you think you can fairly clearly see that the um, historically there, there were double hung windows in, in these window openings. Similarly to what's planned for the, the windows next door, the applicant is proposing to replace the um, non-historic windows. Um, and although you know, staff would be supportive of replacing the non-historic windows with double hung windows, what they're proposing are to, um, to install new windows or even retrofit the existing windows so that, again, they become those awning windows that <coughs> seeing out to be fully horizontal or perpendicular to the building facade. Um, you know, again, as, as I stated in, with the other windows, the operation of a window is intrinsically linked to, its de to the historic building's design and to the overall look, look of a building. Windows are an important part of a historic building's character, and installing windows that do not repl replicate the, his the typical historic windows of the period um, does not meet the design guidelines. So staff finds that either new windows that swing out like this or taking the existing windows and retrofitting them to swing out horizontally does not meet the design guidelines. The applicant also provided a drawing of a, um, another option that they would be willing to consider, which would be a quadruple hung window. Just want to say again, you know, staff finds that that does not meet the design guidelines because historically the windows that were here were, were double hung windows. So. And this is a photograph that the applicant submitted of what, um, you know, what they were thinking the windows would look like and how they would operate. And staff just notes, you know, I think this photograph shows it fairly clearly that w when you're looking at this building from the, from the street, from Broadway or 4th Avenue, changing those windows open like that would make a dramatic difference in the, in the appearance of the structure. So staff recommends, let's go back to the windows, um, that the commission required that the new windows on 4th Avenue North and um, remain as double hung windows and not operate as an awning window. And we also recommend that the historic steel w windows remain fixed and, um, you know, should the applicant want to restore the central hopper operation, we would be fully supportive of that. So in conclusion, staff is recommending approval of the project with several conditions, including one, the number of gooseneck lamps on the ground floor be reduced to have just one lamp per storefront bay, and that the lamps on the rooftop addition be reduced to two on the Broadway facade and three on the Fourth Avenue facade. Two, the applicant not have a continuous line of uplights, but rather have select number of uplights that highlight, ar highlight architectural features of the historic building. Three, the lights under the storefront cornice be removed. Four, the replacement windows for the 4th Avenue North facade and the eastern or right portion of the Broadway facade be double hung windows with a traditional framing system and offset overlapping sashes, and staff review the final window selection prior to purchase and installation. 
five, the historic steel windows remain fixed and the central hopper element be restored if the applicant wishes to have the window open in any way. Six, staff review the proposed installation, me proposed installation method for the facade material for the additions. And finally, seven, the railing be recessed four feet from the Fourth Avenue facade. With these conditions, staff finds that the proposed addition and alterations meet sections two and three of the Broadway Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay Design Guidelines. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Would the applicant like to come forward and state your name and address? Can, can we ask questions before we Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Jumped over that. Excuse me, applicant. Um, uh, yeah, questions. Uh, just one question. Are there sure. are there other of those awning windows? I don't remember seeing those before. Are there? So we have others? never approved them before. Okay, so. we've never approved those before, and they're not. Not even on new construction. We haven't approved them. And they're not found in the district historically. Uh, they're not found in the historic district. Whether or not they're found other places downtown, I don't know, but I have I'm not aware of it. So, but I know we have not approved them, and that they're not existing okay. in our historic districts. Not, not on Broadway. Not on Broadway. Not on Second Avenue. I just wanted to clear state number two again. What's the recommendation on number two? Has it changed from what's on the page? It ha yes, it, d it did change from what's written in your um, staff recommendation because we subsequently received more information. information. So, I mean, um, once we received information on the lighting, staff thought that the continuous line of up lights didn't meet the design guidelines. Um, so we wanted a select number of, of up lights you know, typically if you're seeing um, up lights, they're kind of lining architectural features, so they'll be, for instance, like in between the, the window bays, kind of, you know, on, particularly for the building on 4th and, and Broadway, highlighting the architectural brickwork, that type of thing. Okay, thank you. Yes. Melissa, um, our, we had a case not too long ago where there was a desire to shift what at the time I believe was a historic entry um, and so I wanted to clarify that in staff's opinion, moving of this entry, because it's not historic, is not moving away from compliance or that there's, there's not any question there in, in terms of staff's evaluation that it's... In, in this instance, um, we, because we, we actually have the drawings from 1990, so we saw that, the, that they, we, we know for certain that the existing storefront dates from 1990, so we thought that changing the storefront, because it's not a historic storefront right now, um, would be appropriate. Agreed. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, thanks. Now, open public hearing with the applicant's status name, address, and your case. Yeah, uh, Josh Hughes, uh, 410 Elm Street, Nashville. Hi, folks. Uh, I'm with Tuck In Architects for planning our client today. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank you for your service and, and the role you play in protecting the character of Broadway and other historic areas. Um, real quickly, I'll mention I am, I do serve my community as chair of the Historic Zoning Commission, granted uh, on a much smaller scale, but uh, in uh, Nolensville, Tennessee, so I do understand the tough, tough role and the positions you're put in sitting on that side of the table. Um, so with that said, I'll, I'll do my best to put you in a tough position today. Um, and just for the sake of getting everything out there, I'm gonna kind of jump back and forth between some, some scripted information and, and talking about the drawings. So first, do you, I, mind, I, do you mind speaking up sure. so this end can hear you better? At least I can. Okay. So first, I'd like to convey that our client is fully committed to investing in the renovation and upgrades of the building in ways that will embrace and exhibit its historic character. They've also expressed their strong desire to contribute to the character of the building, uh, to Broadway in a respectful and tasteful manner, which in the same authentic way uh, we accomplished on a previous project, uh, Acme Feed and Seed. Uh, in past conversations, we've heard, referred to that project many times in our des design discussions. Um, and aim to achieve some of the same result. Much of the beauty of the building's existing structure that is covered up or has been covered up in previous renovations, we plan to restore and put on display. Significant investments also need to be made to make the existing floor structure viable in supporting their increased occupancy type 
again, all in a way that will be minimally inva invasive to the existing floor structure. Um, in addition, these, these considerations, uh, given these considerations, we are um, challenged with a much smaller footprint than the majority of other multi-story establishments on Broadway. These all represent not just architectural challenges, uh, but also obstacles to our client in creating a viable and thriving business given all these investments they need to make in the building. I think many would agree that this building was previously underutilized, and much of that's due to the challenges I'm, I'm mentioning here. Um, if, if we could go to the site plan on what's been submitted, um, I'd just like to just give a visual overall. This, our building has a 3,200 square foot footprint uh, as opposed to. I have a roof plan. I don't have a site plan, but okay. I'll show the footprint. So. Well, just for context, this takes up half of the block. Ryman Alley is to the north of this. Have, uh, virtually every other multi story venue on uh, on Broadway is twice as deep. And so we are uh, having to put as much infrastructure into the building, you know, two, two stair towers, an elevator, um, kitchen, all, all, all types of mechanical support space in this small footprint. And you can see when we get up to the rooftop, uh, complying with the setbacks for the, for the building, the vertical structure, we're only left with about 1,200 square feet of interior space, and uh, just about half of it's taken up with vertical circulation and, and core elements. Um, so granted, we're, we are complying there. Um, and, and in addition, it's hard to see without looking at the demo plans, but this, this building has been renovated multiple times in the past, and uh, it's just been cut open and pieced back together over and over, and again, we're trying to bring it back to uh, its somewhat original state, granted that it's unsure of what the original state was on, on some parts of it. Um, <coughs> so we've, over the past couple months, we've worked with staff and um, I think had a good dialogue. Uh, we're more <coughs> or less arguing over three or four issues and uh, you know, last month or a month and a half ago, it was probably closer to 10, so we're doing better. Um, and I'd, I'd like to say, as I, as I get into each issue, um, I don't mean any d disrespect to, to the opinions that have been expressed by the staff, but just that, that we feel that what we're proposing um, is, is not in conflict with what the guidelines say, and, and uh, in most, most respects is in the, in the uh, provides for the intent of what it was established for. So um, regarding the rooftop setback, looking at this, 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 these drawings of uh, 4th Avenue and, and the rooftop, you can see that obviously, again, if, going back to the, the, the footprint issue, we, we start with a major disadvantage to other multi-story uh, entertainment venues on Broadway, um, given that they have twice as much square footage to accommodate the setback and, and deal with core infrastructure. We're making great efforts, completely replacing and lowering the existing roof structure so that at Broadway, we can be at the 42-inch parapet height. Again, this allows us to, to take our terrace out to Broadway, but at the same time, you know, represents a, a significant investment. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, as was pointed out by staff, the parapet does step down along 4th Avenue. It steps, you know, to three different levels. Um, but I would, I would argue that if in, in, a, in other structures that have added rooftops, they've added on top of the existing roof. Um, and if we had used that solution, granted we would be held back eight feet, but it would have raised our rooftop structure up much higher than where it is. Uh, we would have a lower ceiling height at the rooftop, but our, our uh, railing would be much higher. And I would argue that it would be much more visible 
at the back end of the building being five or six feet taller than, uh, well, the floor would be five or six feet taller than the top of the parapet at the back corner of the building. Um, so I, other considerations, I mean, we're, we're willing to explore other materials uh, for that guardrail element, whether it's adding brick, um, although that may not be appropriate, uh, using ultra clear, low, low glare glass with no visible hardware. Um, and I, I would like to point out that the first, you know, the first bay, first quarter, no guardrail is visible. So it doesn't seem like, you know, setback should be established there. In, and even w working down, um, there's, there's, there's lesser visibility towards the uh, Broadway side than, than the alley side. Um, moving on to the, the window discussion, um, in some ways it's the same <clears throat> discussion for both the wood, wood windows and the steel windows in that we are, uh, we're fully committed to maintaining the existing look of the windows from the exterior and to maintaining their structural integrity and in solutions that we are proposing. We have submitted info from the window contractor related to constructability in effort to legitimize and uh, establish our level of confidence in not needing to deviate from the current opening size or aesthetic. Guidelines require that replacements replicate originals, and we are proposing that the look be 100% replicated or maintained in, in both cases. Our only request is to modify the operation so that the units pivot open as a complete leaf and in the case of the steel windows, we would propose to completely re restore them, reglaze them. And any mo modification we make, uh, we would also commit to um, limiting it to the interior side so that it, in the event of a future occupant wanting to reestablish its fixed operation, they could, they could do that if they so choose. Um, I know I'm starting to run low on time couple minutes, I believe. So uh, in, in our opinion, this is no different than what you're accepting down on the storefront, a window that looks like a storefront window but operates differently. Um, we've proposed many other alternatives for the windows, uh, the triple hung, quad hung, um, but we understand the intent is you want the windows to look exactly the same as they do now. Um, just there's, you know, 95% of the time they will, except when the weather is nice enough to open them up. Um, we're willing to, to discuss the other several items with staff, and, and, and we think we can come to a consensus on, on those. Since time is there, real quick, are there any of the uh, conditions that you are okay with, or, or did you... Um we, we are fine working with staff on, on lighting. Okay. Um, so the and, and the cladding material. Okay. Um, we're so it's it's the railing setback that you spoke of and the windows, or which are yes uh, three different ones. Okay. Yes. Um, any questions right now to the applicant? Thank you. Oh, and I do have one which wasn't, I, it may have been shared with you, the uh, contractor's proposal basically on the, on the windows as far as yeah, just, just to legitimize that they, they, they're confident they can, they can do it and it's just not our. Yeah, just give theory. it to him. Let's, uh, let's let her look at it. I don't have time. We'll let you know. Okay, thank you. Uh, open public hearing. Would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Sure. Uh, state your name and address. Uh, just come to the front. Um. Uh, Dirk Smedley, 2300 Charlotte. Um, 
just to reiterate, Josh, it's been fun for me to see what you guys do. To, uh, I love Lord Rodman, love Nashville. Got my start playing all these bars down here. I was the first guy to play the stage. Um, I played for a lot of tips and a lot of bars in Lord Broadway and back in the late 90s. And uh, I used to walk into this, this Gruen guitar shop, this building, um, and look at these great guitars, which I couldn't afford, pull them off the top wall and play them a little bit and set them back up on the, uh, the wall. I love this building. And I've, I've been really fortunate to go from the Hockey Tonks to getting a record deal and, and playing country music and, and be su successful enough to you know, put my name on this particular building. I, I know George Gruen. I love this building, and I want to keep the integrity of this building. I love the way it looks. I love the way those windows looks. I love the way it's two buildings kind of ran together into one. It's got these funky windows on one side and these arch top windows on the other, and definitely want to maintain that look and want to chose to work with these guys. Um, uh, yeah, I, I know that we could replicate the same look, but also kind of keep up with what's going on downtown on Lower, on Lower Broadway. It's a very, as you guys know, there's, there's a lot of people move, coming to town, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of folks coming to, to, Nash, to uh, Nashville, to, and they're looking for uh, you know, country music and our heritage. And we have Roberts, we got Tootsies, we got uh, all these great honky tonks uh, that I love to still go to. But what we're trying to do here is keep something that has that country vibe, that country culture, but in a way that is kind of like Acme, but a little more country. And um, we want to take this building and keep it Keep that look uh, that, that's always had, which I love personally, but also add an element that makes it fun. People come and get some air and uh, you know hang out, and, and, uh, and I think it'll be a pretty significant uh, role in the in the future of uh, country music and that presence on on Lower Broadway. There really isn't something like that down there right now. There's honky tonks, but something that uh, just kind of has a little more of that modern feel. And I think what they're proposing with the the windows does reflect just keeping that heritage, that look, that feel, but also making it usable for very few parts of the year. I mean, sorry, that's going to be, time's up. Um, majority of the other things are going to be closed. You know Nashville's, we got pollen and cold and whatnot, but for certain times it'd be nice to kick those open and get a little more air in the building. So I'm proud to have this place. Thanks for letting me uh, talk to you all. And I've really enjoyed the process of watching what you do. <laughs> okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak regarding this project? Okay, close public hearing. Can I mention one other item on the windows? Uh, we'll, let's see how, if we have any more questions for you and uh, bring it back open. All right, discussion. I guess I do have one question about the windows, which is, is there a safety open, or? I'll open public hearing and you can ask him a question. Sure. Come on, come on. Is there a safety or functional reason that you want the windows to be different? My understanding is they can all be operational the way that the staff has, has put the conditions on it. So there are safety or other functional reasons that you need the windows the, to be different. The, the hopper elements in, in those steel windows, we would have trouble finding a way to, to convert them into, I mean, obviously they operate, but you know they hinge kind of at the halfway point of the opening, and that's kind of right at chin level. Um, I, I don't see there being a real viable public usability there with, with making those, those operable. Um, again, likely going back with single pane glass in those when we reglaze them, uh, you know, we can make it tempered and that'd probably be safe, but um, it just, it, we could, could, could pre represent a head knocker, the whole, I don't, it's not above the six foot eight code clearance. Um, the, the double hung windows, there's no safety concerns. What, a lot of it is, is driven by their desire and need to get, um, to get customers up on the second floor, create a visibility. And I didn't mention this, but the, the second floor is, is the primary area proposed to, I mean, that's, that's the most important area they'd like to get open. And that's because it's elevated off the, the floor. They wanna make sure people from the street see that there is activity up there and they want to draw people past the first floor up, up to that level. Any more questions to that, Pat? We are, w we are willing to, to mock up these, these windows as, as part of this to, to show that we can uh, get them to maintain the existing look. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Oh, okay. So on these um, current double hung, so you would change it to an awning window? It would, it would still be a, it would be a double hung 
Look. looking window. Mm -hmm. You still have one sash in front of the other, but they would be fixed together. So you'd still have, it's in some of, some of a little bit of the documents you, there. You can actually re replicate that to be a awning window is what you're presenting. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to look a like that, pivot, but it's, it's going to be a true pivot window, so, you know, two-thirds of it would open out, or, it would, I mean, it would pivot. Yeah. One-third would be inside the building, two-thirds would be out. Um, but, yes, we've, we've talked through the hardware on it, and, and I have a, a great deal of confidence that we can keep the look and uh, add that functionality. And, and your intent in having open window is to bring that essence of the Broadway opening. So, so, yeah. so many of the establishments down on Broadway, whether it's an infill building or um, you know modifications that were made bef before you guys have have that functionality as part of their business, and, and they're also much larger buildings and so part of that is that you get if you can op open the windows more the, the space feels bigger it's just 3200 square feet half of it's taken up with core and and the space feels tight and, and to make it viable open the inside to out make sure people know stuff's going on up there okay thank you any more questions okay thanks uh close public hearing any more more discussion Well, it sounds like the, the lighting issue, they're in agreement on staff's recommendations there. So that yeah, that's one element, multifaceted element. That's the, I guess the things, we, yeah, the things we want to talk about mm -hmm. is the railing setback and mm -hmm. the windows. windows. Yeah, yeah, and the two windows. On the Broadway side, both of them. Yeah. I think it's important, I, I understand the need and the desire to have those windows open from a business standpoint makes complete sense. Though I feel like we have told countless other applicants in the recent past they can't change fixed windows to open. And so if we did that, we'd be making a, a big change and a permanent change on that and have a lot of angry people. Um, and I think it's important that these awning windows are, we haven't approved those before, so that'd be a big one too. Um, I don't have a good middle ground or solution to that because I think the need is real and, and meaningful, but I don't feel like we've uh, made that exception for anybody else. Uh, the, the railing, it doesn't seem like a huge ask to have it set back. And if it reduces the visibility a great deal from fourth, fourth is a busy street too, especially with property being on the corner. That doesn't seem like a big ask to me. The applicant, I'm not in disagreement with the applicant, I think, made a point that. Uh, oh, up towards the, the front. Yeah, the yeah, slide maybe showed that. It could step in, that would make sense that they wouldn't, they shouldn't lose. At the very front, they shouldn't lose that four feet. And if we're, if we're basing our. Yeah, basing our judgment primarily on the visibility of the railing. That's where I'm coming from. Yeah, in, in, in my mind, the, the question is, is the top, at the step downs, the front one seems not visible at all, so it's equivalent, in my mind, to the Broadway mm -hmm. facade. I, I don't see it necessary there. The question is, at the second one with the narrower street, is that visible just peeking over the top? Could, you know, could half of it be set back from, from the second step down? Would that be acceptable, or do you just want to say where well, it's completely invisible? But it seems a judgment call on our part uh, as to if, if that is the judge of, of, of setback and need for that. Um, I, I don't know what your thoughts on that would be in terms of visibility, but I'm in agreement with you that it, all of the entire setback is is not is not necessarily warranted across the whole Fourth Avenue innovation. Do I understand right from staff that? But the requirement is for it to be eight feet back, and you've said that it can be four feet back on that Fourth Avenue side. Do you have any, sir, about the windows? You know, when, when I when I read through this beforehand, and I went and looked at the property, and read the staff report, uh, and have heard this presentation and all the discussion, I think the staff's really done pretty outstanding job of trying to accommodate and say, gosh, you know, the stairwell 
intrusion is not really salient, and so they think they've worked really well to try to accommodate these needs. I don't see any compelling need with the windows. I wasn't convinced that there's a compelling safety or functional need for this. When I look through the materials here, a lot of the windows that they're proposing are much stockier and more robust framework, which would change the look of either set of those windows. And so I do think keeping the look of the windows, and, and, and both of them, all of them can be functional as it is. Well, while inventive, I, I don't, historically, I, I think there's a little too much room there for it to, it operates in a completely different manner, even if it's only 10% of the time. It, it, you know, double hung window sort of throws the sash up and, and, and there you go. This is a completely different, um, yes. completely, yes. completely different use and, and uh, I, I'm in agreement there as well. What about you guys? I, mean, I agree with that. With <clears throat> What's his name down there? <laughs> I can't remember it for ben. some reason. Ben. I wasn't Wait here. Wait I wasn't up. here the la last. Made that last good of an impression. <laughs> I wasn't here last month, so I, I can't remember any of him. So um, I, I I believe that as well. I think that's a very good point about the difference. It's just a completely different window, and we're getting out of the historical context with the awning window. Um, so I'm persuaded by that argument. And in, in the other whatever to that, persuaded, is that we have not approved that at all on Broadway. So again, we're setting some precedents on, on that issue. Any other guardrail discussion to that? Anything else? Uh, sure. I, I, I think I, I see your point in that. It was a, it's for just given their smaller footprint. I, I think if we're using visibility as, my opinion, if we're using visibility as, as the, um, the determined, it's not the only determining factor there, but I, I, the, the, for the first bay, I, I'm, I'm not, if you can't, if you can't see it, I, I, I'd be giving them that four by 20 foot back to, to as usable space seems. Just seems remember we reasonable. have to speak up too, I'm oh, sorry, sorry, just yeah. because. Uh, it se doesn't seem like an unreasonable component to, to give them that <coughs> what amounts, I guess, uh, on Broadway to very valuable real estate at a rooftop um, back. I, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly wouldn't have a wouldn't have an issue with that one, um, uh, even though the staff has gone some some distance to give some of that real estate back um, in their proposal of four feet along the, the along that facade. Is it true? Um, if I heard the staff right that that there is no setback requirement for the handrail where the parapet is along Broadway where it's at four and a half feet. That's so correct. Yeah, we're saying it's okay not, for it not to be set back because it's completely right. hidden behind the parapet. Well, want to craft a motion? Uh, sure. I recommend approval of 400 Broadway in the uh, Broadway Historic Preservation Zone and Overlay District with the um, Staff's recommendations of items um, three, well, one, one through six with the uh, with, uh, understanding, I think the applicant's gonna come back to staff with some lighting, new lighting information that, that would meet those guidelines. Um, with respect to item six, uh, I would, because in, in areas where uh, the application or shows that the railing would be hidden, and I'm speaking specifically on the first bay as it turns from Broadway to Fourth Avenue where it would be hidden. It, it doesn't need to be set back where it's completely hidden by the parapet, but would need to be set back four feet in other areas. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. The next one is 1825 Fourth Avenue North. Avenue North is an application for a one and a half story addition to a one story house. The historic house was constructed circa 1925 and it is a contributing structure to the Salem Town Conservation Overlay. 
If this house looks familiar to you, it may be because in April of 2015, the commission reviewed and approved an addition to this house. That addition was never constructed, and the applicant has returned with a larger addition um, for this proposal. Staff is recommending disapproval of this application, finding that the addition scale is too large for the modest historic house. The application does involve demolishing an existing covered porch at the rear, which staff finds to be appropriate. Here is the front elevation. The addition will be slightly taller than the existing house. It'll be about four to six inches taller than the historic house, which staff finds to be appropriate because it's you know, located far enough back that it won't really be visible. Here is the site plan. The addition will convert the single family house to a duplex with one unit in the front and another unit in the rear. MHZC does not regulate use, but it does regulate the height, scale, and design of additions to ensure that they do not overwhelm the historic house. The proposed addition will more than double the footprint of the existing house. The current footprint, including the rear porch that will be demolished, is 1,170 square feet. The addition will add 1,442 square feet of footprint to the house. The addition's depth is 54 feet compared to the historic house depth, which is less than 44 feet. And again, those calculations do take into consideration that there's part of the house that's going to be removed. So we calculate it. And, and also in using the calculations we um, for the footprint, we included the front porch, which is open in nature. The design guidelines state, quote, no matter its use, an addition should not be larger than the existing house, not including non-historic additions, in order to achieve compatibility and scale. This will allow for the retention of small and medium-sized homes in the neighborhood. The diversity of housing types and size is a character-defining feature of historic districts. In the past, the MHCC has interpreted this part of the design guidelines by requiring that additions no more than double the footprint of the historic house. Here's a close-up of, of the floor plans. The green portion to the right is the existing footprint. Again, that's including the porch that's going to be removed at the rear. And then the blue portion to the left is the part of the addition beyond the line of the rear covered porch that's to be demolished. And it looks like in the um, in the blue portion that there's just, oh, it's just a covered porch in the rear. But if you look at the design guidelines, I'm sorry, if you look at the side elevations, the, um, that side porch actually has a second story built on top of it. So we include that um, in, in the footprint calculations. So the addition's height out of scale footprint is compounded by the fact that the addition is slightly taller than the historic house and has a one and a half story form attached to a true one story historic house. The footprint, height, and one and a half story form together create an addition that is too large for the historic house. Staff therefore finds that the proposed addition scale does not meet sections 3B and 4B of the design guidelines. Staff also notes that the addition does not include corner boards as is typically required. In addition, the siding reveal is shown as matching the existing non-historic wide siding, and staff would typically recommend that that siding be a maximum of five inches. In addition, there is an expanse of 30 feet, six inches of space without a window or door opening, which is more than double what is typically per permanent. The issues of the corner boards, the window expanses, the siding reveal, those are all things that staff felt that, you know, if the addition were smaller, we could work out with the applicant. But the real reason that we're recommending disapproval is because of the size of the addition. So um, here is the rear facade. And here are some renderings that were submitted by the applicant. In conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the addition, finding that its scale is too large for the historic house and that the cladding material, lack of corner boards, and fenestration patterns do not meet the design guidelines. Staff finds that the proposed addition does not meet the following sections of the Salem Town Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay Design Guidelines, sections 3B for massing, 3D for materials, 3G for proportion and rhythm of openings, 4B for additions massing, and 4G um, that states that an addition should follow the design guidelines for new construction. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions for staff? <coughs> okay. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, would the applicant like to come forward and um, state your name and address? Is the applicant. All right, um, open public hearing. Would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Okay, seeing none, close public hearing. 
uh, discussion or motion? You know, in reviewing this project uh, with the materials that were sent out at a time with the application, driving by the property, you know, I think it's a perfect example of, of what our charge is, is, is to really adhere to the guidelines that were adopted by the neighborhood. And so I recommend for disapproval. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 3609 Catherine Street. You guys tired of me yet? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> You're not losing your voice. <laughs> so, 3609 Catherine Street is an application to construct infill on a vacant lot. Here is a site plan. Until recently, the lot on Catherine Street was part of the lot at 1132A McChesney Avenue. On the image on screen, the red portion to the left is the lot at 3609 Catherine, and the portion, the portion in green on the right is the shortened lot at 1132A McChesney. The new lot is 75 feet wide along Catherine Street and 100 feet deep. The new <coughs> infill meets all base zoning setbacks. Um, a few recommendations that the staff has regarding the site plan. Um, staff recommends that the driveway uh, to the left of the house be extended to the rear. Uh, currently stops about the midpoint of the house. Um, staff also recommends that a walkway be added from the street to the front porch of the house. Here is the front facade. The infill will be one and a half stories with a maximum height of 25 feet. Staff finds that this does meet the historic context. Uh, staff asks that the front porch columns have caps. It's a typical requirement. We also ask that um, it wasn't the base material for the columns wasn't indicated in the plan, so we just ask to review that material. And if it's brick, we'll want to see a brick sample. Uh, staff also recommends that the front dormer windows be paired together to have a four to six inch mullion in between them, and that the front entrance have trim boards around it. Here are the side elevations. On the right elevation, staff asks that the pair of windows either be framed together with a four to six inch mullion in between the windows or be spaced further apart. Um, staff also recommends that the applicant provide more information on the dimensions of material of the side deck. And actually, since I wrote this presentation, the applicant did say that the, the, there was a deck, um, kind of where the windows that are highlighted are, there's a, a deck there, and that's a recessed area. The deck's not going to extend any further than the two bays to the side, and it will be wood, which staff finds to be appropriate. Here's the rear facade. All of the known materials have been approved by the commission in the past, and includes a smooth five-inch cement fiberboard siding, boarded batten, concrete block foundation, uh, I think that's split face concrete, concrete block foundation, and asphalt single roof, roof. Staff recommends approval of all windows and doors and the shingle color prior to purchase and installation. And just here are some context photos. Um, the, this photo right here, these two photos are the house um, that faces McChesney on the other side of the lot. Um, that's the front facade at the top. On the bottom, there's a two-story, non-historic addition appendage to the, to the house, and that's what you're seeing there. And these are some other photographs. Um, the top two, I think, are along the Chesney, and the bottom one is um, Howard Street, which is kind of the, the street just to the south of this. So in conclusion, staff recommends approval um, of the infill with the following conditions. Staff approve the finished floor height to make sure it's consistent with the historic context. Staff <coughs> approve the window choices, the roof shingle colors, um, that column cats be added to the front porch, the um, staff approve the porch column base material. Um, the driveway be extended to the rear of the house, um, and we approve the driveway material. A walkway be added from the street to the front porch, and staff approve the walkway material. The pair of windows in the front dormer on the right side elevations um, be paired together with a four to six inch mullion, or be pushed further apart so that they're two separate window openings. Trim boards be added around, around the front entrance, and then finally, staff approve the HVAC location. Um, with that, I think the applicant is here if you have questions for him. Okay. Any more questions for staff? On the, is the left side elevation visible from the street? Um, it, yes, I'll show you the, the site. It probably will be. Um, the, um, yeah. the, well, this is probably a constructability issue, but we're, the corner board sort of engages with the window trim on that little central area. <coughs> On the one hand, I doubt it could be constructed like that, and on the other, I think we it needs a little breathing room there, maybe perhaps. Um, I don't, I don't think you can get a window in that corner in that in that fashion. But I could be wrong. I could be proven wrong. But mm -hmm. I, I, nevertheless, I think 
It's a little confusing to have the corner board and the window trim sort of smashed up together. I didn't know if that was a particular <laughs> design issue. I, that, yeah. that was not phrased as a question. No, I no, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I think, anymore. yeah, if, it, if it's a constructability issue, I'll, I'll let the applicant handle it. I mean, I think, you know, even as design, even. It, it will be visible, but it's not going to be a predominant feature when you see it from the street. So staff didn't have an issue with it in terms of a, a look of it. All right. Any more questions? Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, open public hearing. Would the applicant like to come forward and state your name and address? Uh, Jason oh, you better get to go right to the mic. Sorry. Uh, Jason Quorum, 1619 Holly Street. Uh, East Nashville. Uh, I'm fine with all the conditions. I guess the only minor thing was having the sidewalk to the street. Um, we built houses or renovated houses around the corner and the, there's no sidewalk and the sidewalk just kind of leads out and then there's like 10 feet to the road and the sidewalk just ends into grass and it looks funny. So what I've done in the past was not include that portion and just connect it to the driveway or whatever. And seems to make sense instead of having just driveways that lead nowhere. It looks kind of funny as you drive down the street. That's it, basically. And I guess I had, I was trying to make the driveway not go back as far, um, but I, I was under, I didn't quite understand how far they wanted me to go back. I'm probably fine with going back to where they went or where they want us to go. So. Okay, um, any questions for the applicant? Do you, do you want to ask your window question? Oh, um, <laughs> the, I think with the window trim, yes. you, you're kind of jamming that window right in the corner. Right. I think once they put the jam, build the jam for the window, it'll, it'll be a tough one to pull off on the outside. So yeah, uh, it's, it's meant to tend to be a corner, corner window. window. So is there one around the other corner as well? Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's recessed, but gotcha. You but it, it, it doesn't construct. I mean, uh, if you pulled it off it. before, then all right. <laughs> it might have to move in a little bit. But okay. Yeah. Anything else before Jason? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Seeing none, close public hearing. Uh, discussion? I move to adopt staff recommendation for 3609. Captain? Second. Okay, have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, let's see. 2119 Westwood Avenue. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry. I pulled the wrong page. <laughs> Thank you for the moan. Uh, 1415 McKinney Avenue. <laughs> Caught me off guard there. <laughs> All right. Um, so this uh, is for 1415 McKinney Avenue. It is a request <coughs> to demolish an existing non contributing outbuilding and to construct a new outbuilding. And the request does include a rear setback determination. Um, the outbuilding meets the design guidelines for everything except setbacks and footprint. Um, staff recommends approval of the proposed demolition uh, of the existing outbuilding as the Sanborn maps do illustrate that um, it, it is non-contributing as it was not there historically. Um, the proposed outbuilding is located um, to the rear of the lot with parking from the alley. Uh, since the lot is less than 10,000 square feet, the maximum foot footprint for an outbuilding on this lot is limited to 750 square feet. Um, the proposed footprint is 820 square feet. So the outbuilding exceeds the, the, the footprint by 70 square feet. So while the proposed outbuilding is it's not a detached accessory dwelling unit um, and doesn't have to meet those DADU standards, staff finds that the, the overage is is pretty significant um, and recommends a condition that um, the footprint of the outbuilding be reduced so that it does not exceed that maximum of 750 square feet. Um, and that's to ensure that it's appropriately scaled for this site. So since the, the footprint does exceed 700 square feet, um, and Melissa brought this up with a previous case, the base zoning requires a 20 foot setback um, and the applicant has requested to reduce that to six feet. Um, staff recommends approval of that setback determination, finding um, it to be appropriate as outbuildings are located historically closer to, closer to or even on the rear property line. Um, 
The overall height of the outbuilding is 25 feet with an average eave height of 12 feet, um, both of which meet the design guidelines and are subordinate to the, the historic house. So here we see the, the front and the left side, the right and the garage doors facing the alley. So in conclusion, staff recommends um, approval of the, the demolition as well as the outbuilding and setback determination with conditions including that the, the footprint not exceed 750 square feet. All right, any questions for staff? Just a quick question, Melissa. Um, on that 750, you're talking the six foot setback, and that's an if it's 750 square foot, if that requirement is met. Well, the, the threshold is 700, so if, um, if you approve it with that condition that it be taken down to 750, it would apply, and if you decide that what they're proposing is appropriate and approve it at 820, it would apply as well. So either way, it would need a setback determination. In the six foot, but you're approving, but the We're staff is approving correct. the six foot setback. We're, yes, we are recommending approval. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right, any more questions, right? Okay, open public hearing. Applicant like to state your name and address. Hi, is this on or? Not really. So oh, just okay. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm not yelling at you. I'm just reading fast and loud. Okay. It is for the recording. Okay. All right. Good. Um, the reduced setbacks is pretty normal for uh, garages and outbuildings in um, UZO. Um, there was several. Uh, approved today with reduced setbacks. I don't believe that's the issue. Uh, my client is asking for this approval. Uh, respectfully, my client is asking that the garage be submitted based on the accessory uh, building floor area control set forth in the Metro Code section 17.12.050. Uh, they are make the staff is making a lot of comparisons that this is a dadu. It is not a dadu. The building can be 750 square feet or 50% of the uh, building coverage of the principal dwelling. That's from the accessory building floor area controls. DADU is short for Detached Accessory Dwelling Unit. This is a very restrictive ordinance uh, because of the use. They wanted to keep it small because of people living in it. The definition of it, again, dwelling unit. Dadu is an outbuilding, but an outbuilding could be something else or not be a dadu. It could be a garage, garden, shed, studio, but no one can legally live in it in these building types. Um, there's an issue here with the staff enforcing the dadu ordinance or requirements on all outbuildings in historic overlays, which would be changing base zoning and changing the original historic guidelines without going through the proper procedure set forth by our Metro government in section 17.40.050 of the Metro codes. Robin has stated today and in emails to me that the, the guidelines have not changed and this garage would have been proved no problem prior to this DADU uh, being voted in. Um, if the neighborhood would like to legally change or add it to the historic guidelines, they have the right to do so through this process. The historic guidelines belong to the neighborhoods and not to an or the Metro government. The staff has added or inserted DADU language in the italicized text of the section uh, of the guidelines. I believe this is legal because the DADU ordinance went through the proper channels of approval with the city's residents and council members. However, with the insertion of the data requirements in the guidelines, the staff also added two other words after the data or outbuildings. This is, to me, not legal because you're changing base zoning and it didn't go through the proper procedure. I live in, I have property in historic overlay. I was never uh, notified of any public hearings, public <coughs> debate, council meetings or anything. Um, this added italicized text in the guideline isn't part of the original guidelines, like I've stated, but went through its own due process. My understanding of the italicized text in the guidelines is for clarification, guidance, and interpretation based on my emails I got from staff during this application. Um, during this application, I asked many questions and found out there was one meeting about garage and outbuildings per Robin. Um, and that was around July 7th and I found that out. I um, 
While attending these meetings, I'd heard Robin state many times to you guys who are trying to understand all this, that uh, there were lots of com community meetings and this is what people wanted. So I thought to myself, I guess there were a lot of community meetings about garages and dadus and I just didn't know and I didn't know that some things had changed. But I found out differently. There was one garage and uh, outbuilding meeting, community meeting, 13 people attended, 13 people attended people. Three to five of those people are really hardcore complainers, which they have a right to. People have a right to complain and voice their opinion about any of this, as we are here today doing. Um, I was, there's 10 staff members, roughly from the Metro site, it says 10, there's nine of you guys, and then 13 people attended this meeting. And it seems like a very small group of people decided to add that or outbuildings to the guidelines, which changes base zoning. It changes the footprint. You are changing what people can do to their property. It's not an interpretation, a guidance, or a clarification. Now, Brett has submitted a letter today um, here, and just a couple of things. Um, the fourth paragraph, he's talking about an infill structure which has nothing to do with a garage or outbuilding. Paragraph five, he's stating basically all of the guidelines that refer to dadus, but he's calling it the present guidelines for outbuildings limits their footprint. Um, I don't believe that's to be true uh, and it's not been voted in. If, if Eastwood would like to do that, I would support them all the way. I would support them changing anything they wanted to or add to the guidelines. I believe it's kind of been slipped in and most homeowners don't realize it. Um, and if the guidelines haven't changed, then this garage should be approved as is and there's no difference to the one that was actually approved today except for, let's see, 1324 Stratton Avenue is a, hold on here, 820 square foot garage or outbuilding. And the difference is that the lot is over a thousand square feet and this lot for my client is under a thousand square feet. So that's my case is basically you're trying to enforce DADU regulations on outbuildings and the DADU regulation is so strict because of the use, because people were concerned about having little houses built in their, in their uh, backyard. Mm -hmm. Only reason it was architecturally restrictive, and I doubt that actually the homeowners wrote those guidelines for the dad do. Someone else did that, so anyway, that's all I have, and I'm available for any questions. First, uh, Lynn, would you mind just stating, just for the record, your name and Oh address. yes, I'm Lynn Taylor, and uh, I'm a residential designer representing the client, and I actually live in the Shelby Hills area. Any questions for the plan? So I have something to say. I just wanted to clarify one of your concerns uh, on changing the design guidelines. There is um, a duty for them to provide notice if the design guidelines were changed, but the design guidelines have not been changed. Um, I believe you're talking about some of this italicized portion. The italicized portion is there to provide clarification on the design guidelines. If the design guidelines were changed, um, notice would be sent out. Yes, I agree. I, and I did say that the Talisad section, I, as I was understanding, they, that's been told to me that they're there for clarification, guidance, and uh, uh, three words I used here, so. But the design guidelines, you mentioned the well, if you all are going to enforce base zoning changes of a DADU ordinance that had to go through the process, Metro's process, I mean, you understand there's a process to get an ordinance passed. Yes, I am. And an ordinance changes base zoning, correct? Typically, it did here in the DADU. And that is a dwelling unit. And the reason it is so constrained is because of the use dwelling unit a house is my understanding of that ordinance. I just wanted to clarify that the design guidelines have not changed. I know, I've been told that. Yeah. I've said that. Okay. But yeah. if you're going to enforce it, it means something's changed. I didn't get a notice that I couldn't build a bigger garage or whatever. As many people, there was actually one person here I think that said that today. They hadn't been informed. Okay. Any more questions to the applicant? Okay. Thanks, Lynn. Um, open public hearing. Would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Close public hearing. Discussion? What does bay zoning allow? 
Um, base zoning allows for a 700 square foot building or 50% of the existing structure, whichever is greater. But of course, you follow your design guidelines, not base zoning. Understood. And in, in her square footage, is that 820 above or beyond the 50%? I think it's, it's, it's one square foot less. One square foot less. To okay. right at the point. I would like to add that I did a little more research on outbuildings because this comes up every single month. Um, and of course the design guidelines that haven't changed talk about outbuildings being appropriate for our historic neighborhoods in terms of the historic buildings are associated with and in terms of the overall district itself and other outbuildings. So um, thinking of a maximum of a 700 square foot outbuilding, that is 204% larger than the average historic outbuilding. And then thinking of 25 feet, which is the maximum, uh, according to the italicized information, that's 66% taller. Now certainly an outbuilding today has got to be bigger than historic outbuildings because they're not big enough for today's cars. But when you sat down after receiving so much public input in multiple public hearings, individually, and in terms of those charrettes, you had agreed because one of the recommendations was, actually I think it was Ms. Taylor who, who recommended that they be the same, that it's easier. And it made sense to me and it made sense to all of you when you had your meeting that was noticed, um, this is what you agreed to. Any other comments? Robin, the, the reason the, uh, the outbuilding on Stratford was slightly larger <coughs> than what you're recommending approval for here that was because the lot was substantially larger as well. I'm sorry, what was the question? Okay. The, on consent agenda today, there was a Stratford. now building on Stratford that I think had a bigger footprint, but that was because the lot was bigger, bigger than 10,000 square feet. I'm not real sure. <coughs> yes, uh, that was a lot of 10,000 square feet. Which allows for 1,000 yeah. square feet. But I think it was pretty clear early on Maybe it was the first or second case, maybe the first today, <coughs> that um, nobody else is really interested in peeking into Pandora's box with me on this to try to see what we can do with outbuildings. That's fine. I think that's probably the right thing to do. Uh, and that we have interpreted the guidelines uh, to mean that uh, in terms of scale, height, footprints, that the data ordinance is a good benchmark and we've been following it, that's how we've interpreted the guidelines. We haven't changed the guidelines, but that's how we've interpreted them. And the guidelines override the base zoning. And um, we've already stretched, as Robin made the point, we've stretched out buildings already to be much larger than they were historically because of practical concerns. And now we're being asked to stretch them some more. And I think it's pretty clear that the commission wants to draw this line, at least for now. And in order to be consistent, I think staff recommendation makes sense. And especially with the number of outbuildings and the pressure to make them bigger, I think consistency is really important. So I think staff made the right call uh, following the precedent. And for us to not follow that now, especially in light of the first decision today, would be clearly inconsistent. So um, that's my thoughts on that. I'll make a motion unless anyone else has something to say. And just one, one other, and just listening to what the applicant has, has commented as well, is that because this, the lot size is under 10,000, she understands that that 750 guideline is there. So I just want to acknowledge that, that she, you know, the applicant acknowledged it. Yeah, and the lot size is relevant to context. Again, tying it back to the guidelines, it's... We're, we're used, we, we've set these, these dimensions and they're fairly rigid, but they're not out of thin air. It's, it's meant to uh, provide, uh, it, 
it recognizes context, and but it's also meant to provide something that can be administered consistently. consistently. Yeah, I think that's a, a real important word is consistency, uniformity, and I think that's very important. Okay. Any more discussion? Do you, you might want to make a motion? I will make a motion. I would like to, I have a few more minutes oh. on my 10. Okay. Oh. Chair. Well, oh, no actually, it was uh, at the end of public hearing. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> that we but some rebuttal. things you said were wrong. I, the thousand square foot lot is part of the DADU. It's not part of the original guidelines. It's, a, it's part of the DADU. 10,000, not 10,000. Okay. Um, you were making a motion? Yes, sir. If, you, if we're all ready. Do you mind repeating? Yeah, Are we ready? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I make a motion on 1415 McKinney Avenue to approve per staff recommendation. Second. Second. Keep left it hanging there. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. 916 Montrose Avenue. Nine sixteen Montrose Avenue is an application for new construction of a two-family residence and outbuilding and demolition of this non-contributing structure built in 1985. <coughs> the new building is proposed at two stories and a maximum height of 33 feet 6 inches. Nearby contributing buildings are up to 34 feet tall, so staff found that the height is compatible with the context. The widest contributing buildings on this block face uh, are as wide as 41 feet for one-story homes. The tallest buildings are not that wide. For example, the nearest contributing building to the subject property shown in the street view in the middle of this uh, is 32 feet in width. The neighboring home across the street, um, you'll see pictures of that later. There's also one at the top of this, is a two-story building that is uh, a total of 42 feet at the widest, um, but staff's review was that the, that width is not the bulk of the building. It's in uh, a couple of parts uh, that are kind of staggered, and I'll show you that next. Um, you can see sort of uh, marked in the middle, the uh, it's been a porch added onto on the, the uh, left shot there. Um, oh, I forgot I did that. Uh, and then that's the other side over there is uh, an addition that uh, probably would not have been recommended. Uh, it, it's a not uh, original or a contributing part of that, uh, that home that goes wider. Um, the side and rear elevations, the location, the new structure will be centered on the lot. As you see here, the side and rear setbacks meet the base setback requirements. The front setback is at 38 feet and 8 inches. Staff uh, estimated the nearest contributing building, 920, uh, on this block as being 32 feet from the front property line and has recommended that this uh, new building match that setback with a site plan showing uh, that structure, the historic building, to verify the setback. This is the proposed outbuilding, uh, one story garage with two bays that meets the design guidelines. Context photos down the street. Um, that's a non-contributing building about four or five years old in the foreground. That's 919 Montrose across the street. Uh, in summary, staff recommends approval of this application with the following conditions, that the width is reduced to 36 feet, the front setback match that of the contributing structure at 920 Montrose Avenue to be verified with a revised site plan, that staff verify the finished floor height, uh, have approval of the roof color, windows, doors, and other materials, uh, and that HVAC and other utilities are located uh, for minimal visibility from the street. With these conditions, uh, staff finds that the proposal meets the design guidelines for the Waverly Belmont uh, Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Okay. 
and the applicant is here as well. Any questions for staff? So, so the reduction in width, can you tell me again the guideline that applies to that? Um, the guideline is to be compatible with the context. The range of widths, um, Mr. Root will, will discuss in some depth. I know he wants to talk about that. The, um, the range on this block face of the street uh, is up to 37 feet for two-story homes. It does get wider for one story. Um, therefore, it was staff's recommendation that this would be more of a compatible um, building at a more narrow uh, width overall. I can add that that specific design guideline is rhythm of spacing, and the way we've always approached that is, is looking at the widths, because all the, the lots are you know, similar in size. So if we look at the widths of the building, that assures that rhythm of spacing. <coughs> all right, thanks, Paul. Open public hearing with the applicant. State your name and address. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is John Root, 753 Alloway Street. I'm the architect for the project. Um, I wanted to, uh, very importantly, I wanted to show you these pictures. This is actually the same uh, design that we're presenting to you today. It's been built at 1727 Fourth Avenue North uh, with a sister house right next to it at, seven, at 1729. Um, so the house that we're, we're duplicating is the one uh, on the top left corner. And um, this was previously approved by this board, I think it was a year and a half ago, in Salem Town, which, you know, uh, one could argue that larger homes exist in the Waverly Belmont district than Salem Town. Um, you know, the, I think we agree with uh, staff's recommendation except for the width of the home. Uh, you know, taking three feet off the home is a significant um, hardship for us to do that with a duplex. And, um, you know, staff pointed out correctly that the home across the street that's 42 feet is not in the bulk width of the home. Um, but I was also argue that this design doesn't, ha doesn't have 40 feet in the bulk of the home either. Actually, the, the gable that protrudes out is 26 foot eight, and we have a huge wraparound porch that wraps around that. So the mass of the structure is actually set back 18 feet four inches from the front of the porch. So we went into this discussion um, back a year and a half ago when we talked about this design, and I think at that time we all agreed that the massing was, was done in a way that it uh, was compatible with the neighborhood. And um, being in the Waverly Belmont district, I would say, you know, we, we did some research for you. All the red, the green is the uh, subject property, and all the red around us is all homes over 37 feet in width. Um, so there's a large amount of larger homes in, just on this, on this street. Um, and so we, the first sheet, if I'm, did you, were you able to capture all the, yeah, so we, we've recorded all, this is all from the property tax data. Uh, there's a couple 41s in there, there's a 44, uh, and there's a 42 directly across the street, uh, as previously noted, 39s. So there, there, there's absolutely a precedent for larger width homes in the neighborhood, and those are mostly not duplexes, those are single family homes. Um, the next sheet over, of course, is the, is the 42 foot width home right across the street that, we, uh, that is our direct context. Um, being two and a half stories tall, like what we're proposing, having a wraparound porch on one side of the house, the actual uh, face of that home is actually wider than what we are proposing across the street. So this is, this is wider at the front gable there. Um, we've got several examples, we can go through them all if you wish, but you know, we've, we've tried to find uh, legitimate examples of, of two-story wide homes in the context of smaller homes around them, you know, and, and I think Waverly Belmont is a very good district that you can, you can pick out a lot of examples of this home. Um, so I guess we would, we would assert that, and, and please request the board to approve the width as submitted. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Open public hearing. I'd like to state your name and address. I'm William Smallman, and I am the owner of the property. I um, live at 1512 Paris Avenue. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out goes very well with what John was saying, but I actually did the median of the block face of the 900 block of Montrose on the north side, which is where I am. 
the median of contributing homes only, so I took out non-contributing, is 41 feet. So we are actually below the median of the block base. I thought that would help to you know. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Any rebuttal? <laughs> no? Okay. Closed public hearing. Discussion? Well, 919 Montrose across the street is, seems like compelling example to me. So what was staff's thinking in not finding uh, guidance in the 41 feet there? I think primarily, uh, sir, it's that the, the bulk of this home um, is not uh, as much as, as, um, as what's proposed here, although the overall width, I'll go back to it. Um, at those points, yes, adds up to 42 feet. Um, oh, because the wraparound porch, you're saying that back. Yes, sir, that, that enclosed portion and the, the addition uh, on the right um, that that width is is the the total uh, width that we're that we're um, talking about. Whereas this, um, you know, that's 39 feet four inches for a uh, a, a big portion. You know, the the front um, the uh, between the porches I think is 28 feet and change. Is that right? Um, uh, so that certainly would, you know, um, it decreases the perceived kind of massing of the house, but that overall uh, width, our review was that it could stand to be reduced given that it's a two-story home. Can we see the, I think the applicant provided a photograph of the as constructed um, in another district that I just- In Salem to Town, yeah. yes sir. Yeah. The perceived mass on that is, from the street is helpful. Thank you. I think the fact that the, the 39 feet being pushed back and also on the second story being set in to what is it, 30 feet roughly, really does reduce the massing a lot. Um, I'm interested to hear what other people think, but I'm inclined to split the baby a little bit more with something like 38 feet, uh, given the widths of a number of other houses in the immediate area, recognizing that the one-story examples are less relevant, but there still are a number of large houses around there and I don't think, especially the way it's designed with the wrap front porch reducing the massing, I don't think it's generally incompatible. I think we're, we could get pretty close to what they want and be in the guidelines. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I don't think just looking at the homes that were um, featured um, that this house that's being proposed by the applicant is is out of the historic context of the neighborhood. You've got different looks uh, and different, well, we don't, this is the neighborhood, but I think what I'm trying to say is that it's still within the historic context of the overall neighborhood. So I don't think it's really, uh, I, I wouldn't disagree with this. In that slide, you know, rhythm and spacing is, you know, you got two, two really prob in terms of value that these houses on the other side bring. I, it wouldn't surprise me if those two houses get replaced, but that's really neither here nor there. If you had a, you know, a block of similarly scaled houses um, as designed, I think would certainly, with 10 feet between them, would, would not be an inappropriate rhythm or spacing. And I, I'm in agreement. I think it's kind of consistent with the rhythm and spacing is what I'm really trying to say. It's it's um, within the historic context of this neighborhood. Okay. I, it will be missing a couple of teeth on either side, but with this one you know, in, in the middle, it certainly moves more towards a, a 
Assistant and what's across the street. Living in space. Anybody else? Chair, or motion? Chairman, I will abstain. You'll abstain? Yes, sir. Okay. Motion, anyone, or any more discussion? Let me get back up here. If someone disagrees, I'd like to hear talk about it, but um, it seems like people are yeah, that mostly in agreement that um, so. we get staff's recommendation up here, so I'm I can work on it. <laughs> or unless you got it, go yeah, for I'm it. I'm, done. I'm, done. I'm not moving that fast. <clears throat> The question for me is whether um, it should be 39.4 or something a little less. And we're getting down to splitting hairs, but um, I thought 36 was probably overly restrictive. 38 sounds about right, but I also don't think 39's out of whack either. So if anybody's got some strong opinions one way or the other. I'll give it a shot. Uh, make a motion to uh, recommend approval based on staff's uh, recommendation with the exception that in point one, uh, we don't require that the building's width be reduced, but instead the maximum width uh, be 39 feet, four inches, provided that the, uh, the the facade and the uh, the wraparound porch and all of those elements that, that help reduce the massing stay in place. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. And one abstination. Uh, motion carries. Um, before we move to the next one, I know we've had a couple of bathroom breaks does anybody else do? we've been going out for a couple when hours when the break now. it was a necessity <laughs> <laughs> to go we've had a no assassin house break <laughs> any more yes, anybody sir. else need one good. you guys okay i'm good you okay <laughs> sir old ben all right we'll plow on then um 2803 oakland avenue <clears throat> okay ready here uh, 2803 Oakland Avenue uh, this is an application to construct a detached accessory dwelling unit at the rear of the lot the house was built uh, uh, 2009 to 2010 uh, it was approved by this commission uh, and it received a preservation award for infill from the MHC in 2011 and the proposed outbuilding will be one and a half stories tall with a cross gabled roof, uh, very much uh, similar to the character and form of the, of the principal building. Uh, same cross gabled roof, same materials, uh, very similar overall character. Um, as I said, the new building will be one and a half story uh, with a cross gabled roof. Um, it uh, does require a setback determination to be located five feet from the rear property line. The building is under 700 square feet, uh, but the standard setback is 10 feet. They're requesting five, uh, which is uh, typical for the location of historic outbuildings. Staff finds that setback appropriate. Uh, the setbacks are, side setbacks are also appropriate and require no determination. Uh, there are the side elevations. The stairs on the Dadu are uh, enclosed within a screen wall, uh, not within the interior of the building proper. Uh, staff asks that the applicant ensure that the stairs are fire rated to ensure <coughs> to the satisfaction of building codes and the fire marshal. Um, there's a floor plan uh, and roof plan. Staff recommends approval of the detached accessory dwelling unit with the following conditions. That staff shall approve the window and door selections prior to purchase and installation. That staff shall receive a uh, restrictive covenant for the dwelling prior to issuing a permit. And that the stairs are enclosed and fire rated. 
uh, with those conditions. Staff finds that the detached accessory dwelling unit meets the DADU ordinance and applicable sections of the design guidelines for this neighborhood. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Any more questions for Sean? Have we, my sense is that we typically or maybe always require that the stairs be enclosed. Is that right? It is a requirement of the DADU ordinance okay. that stairs be enclosed. Um, so it's we couldn't even deviate from that if we wanted to, right? Right, we couldn't deviate. Now these are within a screen wall. Um, I, I spoke with the fire department and they said it would not meet their requirements. There you go. To have it exposed. To have just a screen wall and have the roof project out. So it's covered by the roof and it's visually covered by the, the screen wall, but it's not enclosed in a manner that meets their fire code. It does not meet the fire. It does not. Okay. Yeah, I think in the recommendation, staff is kind of, they're driving the bus in terms of meeting, meeting the guideline. That, that, that if you can get it through permit review, then you're good to go. Based on the elevations presented today. Is that reasonable? Well, except that they're asking you for this, and, and you wouldn't want to approve it if it's not going to meet the code. All right. No more questions for Sean? Thank the applicant is here. I'm just going to stay up here just because we idea. don't have the remote. Good idea. But, um, but the applicant is here You have to do well. your timekeeper too, though. Yeah. Multitask. <laughs> <laughs> okay, open public hearing with the applicant. I'd like to state, oh, state your name and address, please. My name is Bill Johnson, 2803 Oakland Avenue, owner and architect. Um, and we agree uh, with all of staff recommendations. About this, this stair, um, not aware of the fire marshal's recommendation actually so i don't know if that's a something that we have on record that we can review to attempt to reconcile or was that just there's verbal? nothing to review other than that's what's in the code mm -hmm. and i asked if it would meet and i and i got the answer no okay so i don't have did he quote anything. a portion of the code or what yeah um, section of the code that he was yeah referencing? let me pull up do you have the staff recommendation mm -hmm. accessory dwelling units with a second story dwelling unit shall enclose the stairs interior to the structure and properly fire rate them for the applicable life safety standards found in the code additions adopted by the Metro government. Okay, so. Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Our intention would be simply meet the code. Okay. So you agree with all staff recommendations? Correct. Okay, any questions for the applicant? I don't. Um, well, once we close the stair, it's still within the... The footprint is around 600 or 650 or so, whatever actually it shows on that. Good, good. Uh, it was labeled. Um, and that includes the stair screen, so enclosing it would not change the setbacks or right. anything like that. Okay, thanks. Um, open to the public, would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Seeing the closed public hearing, we have a motion. Move to approve. Okay. I have a comment. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Go, you want to I've go ahead got and my back to you. I'm, I'm sorry. Get out well, here. Have, so I don't know okay, what well, we have a motion. Yeah. Second. Okay, we have a motion and second. Discussion? Yes. Just <laughs> with that conversation about the fire rating and how it's uh, according to the fire marshal, does that need to be stated on your recommendation? It is. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's there. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, 1710 Shelby Avenue. I'm handing this one over to our intern, Ryan Jarles, who right. you met earlier in the meeting. He'll uh, take it from here. Okay. All right. This is 1710 Shelby Avenue, and the application is for the construction of infill on a vacant lot. The lot is being divided from a double lot with a contributing house located on that side. 
The building will be a one and one half story house with a front gabled roof with a recessed front porch. Both sides of the roof will have shed dormers. The dormers sit back from the first story wall, nearly three feet, which is typical of the dormers historically in that area. The height and width and the materials of the new house are compatible with surrounding historic houses, and the overall form and character is appropriate for the neighborhood. The building is deeper front to back than a typical historic house. Uh, however, the right elevation, oh, where? The right elevation is articulated with the porch and the recessed section uh, of the wall, which helps to break up the length. And this is just a 3D rendering of that side as well. The left elevation does not have a break as the right side does, so the staff recommends that some articulation be added because the house sits at the left setback, so moving the house over to the right would, would require a bump out or some other thing to the left. And so that's the left. Okay. So in summary, staff recommends approval of the application with the following conditions, that the finished floor height be consistent with the finished floor heights of the adjacent historic houses and to be verified by MHCC staff in the field. Two, the house be moved to the right three feet. Uh, the two frontmost windows on the left side, elevation to be at least as tall as they are wide or square. As you can see in that picture, they're long and rectangular. Uh, the location of the parking areas via the rear to be added to the site plan. Staff approval, the final details, dimensions, materials of windows, doors, walkway, and driveway prior to purchase and installation. Staff approved the roof color, dimensions, and texture, and the HVAC be located behind the house or either side beyond the midpoint of the house. With these conditions, staff finds that the infill meets the design guidelines for new construction and the Edgefield Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. And I also like to add the applicant has already agreed to all the conditions and has started making the re revisions. Okay. Great. Any okay. questions for Ryan? Curio just curiosity, what was the move three foot? Um, on the left side, since it's so long, if they were to move it over, they could add like a bump out to make it less. Did you just say that, and I just didn't hear it? Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Is the applicant here would like to come forward and state your, even though you said that you just state your name and address and for the record. <laughs> Uh, David Baird, uh, applicant and architect, 5411 Centennial Boulevard. Uh, we agree with all the staff's recommendations. We've been working with them the past couple of days to, to make those revisions and uh, have, have submitted them uh, as of yesterday. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for that? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Open public hearing. Anyone like to speak regarding this project? Seeing none, close public hearing. Do you have a motion? Move the first staff recommendation of 17 second. Shelby. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. 1404 Lillian Street. Our battery's dying, so we gotta gotta move on. Um, <laughs> So this next case, 1404 Lillian Street. Um, the applicant was here, but they seem to have stepped out. She thought she'd be back, but she's not. Um, do you want to take bait first, just to give her if a If that's all right, okay. Okay, sure. So we'll, we'll go to 1003 um, bait, just in case the applicant gets back. All right. Battery's about to die <laughs> <laughs> on the computer. Can you add a little bit of It'll reach. It'll reach right there. I think she's done. I'm going to say, 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 I'm going
don't trip over there. Let's just stand along. Okay. Don't trip. Don't touch it. All right, so 1003 Bait Avenue, this is a request to construct a new single family home and detached garage. Um, the house is, oh, sorry, um, the house located, go back to what is shown here, the house located on the house, um, on the site um, is non-contributing uh, as it was built in 1969 and a demolition permit was issued in April of this year um, and I went by there, the house has been torn down. Um, so the plan for the infill that's before you meets the design guidelines for height, scale, setbacks, rhythm of spacing, materials, roof form, orientation, um, and rhythm and proportion of openings. Um, as proposed, the infill is oriented toward Bait Avenue. Uh, with parking off the alley. Uh, the structure is one and a half stories uh, with a maximum of 27 feet, 10 inches, and an eave height of 11 feet at the front. Um, the historic context in the immediate area ranges from 17 feet to 28 feet and includes primarily one and one and a half um, story homes. So there's the front and the left side elevation, the right side elevation and the rear. Uh, the detached garage has a footprint of 528 square feet and an overall height of 22 feet, one inch, with an average eave height of 11 feet. Um, the outbuilding meets the design guidelines with um, minimum and the minimum setbacks per the zoning code. Um, so there you have, and there you can see it in relation on the right side to the house and on the left side to the house. And then finally, we have some context photos. The top left photo is the, um, the contributing house directly across the street, and the other two photos are um, on the same side of the street as 1003 Bait, but kind of further down to the right. Um, so in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the infill and outbuilding, finding that they are, that they do meet the design guidelines, um, and that recommendation does include conditions that are set forth in the staff recommendation. Okay. Any questions for staff? The, the distance from the, do we have an appropriate distance from the back of the house to the garage? Yeah. I know we've focused on that in the past. Right. Before and we ask that question of applicants in the past. Right. Well, for a, for a, a dadu, it's typically 10 feet. Um, uh, I think it's been reduced to uh, as little as, as 8 to 10 feet. Um, in this case, it, it cannot be a dadu. It's a uh, detached garage. So with no issue there. Is, yeah. the, is that just a rendering, the, the scallop look on the porch rack? Is, is that a rendering thing, or are we doing sort of an arch? No, I think those are, are shadows, but the, the applicant can, can speak, speak to that as well. All right, thanks, Dan. The applicant would like to come forward, state your name and address. Sandy Adams, 513 Windsor Drive. And I'm the applicant for bait, and I've agreed with um, the recommendations from staff. Those are um, arched beams on the front of the porch. Okay. Any questions for staff? I mean, I'm sorry, to the applicant? So that would be, uh, it'd be a, built as a rectangular rack and then just have the, uh, a bead sort of trim that makes the arch, or is it a true? It's an actual arch. It's an actual arch. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very good. Okay. All right. If no questions, thank you very much. Open public hearing. If, if you would like to say anything, you <laughs> close public hearing. <laughs> Do we have a motion? Uh, a question? Clarification for staff is, uh, I know we've, sorry to be picky, but consistency, consistency reigns. Um, have we had comment on brick, brick versus concrete steps in the past? These are called out as brick. And would that be something we'd need to, that, that's is, this, a, is this district different in some way? Or that's a good we, catch. They really should be a, a concrete, concrete or wood. Um, and in reference to the scallop, that is something you see historically around town. Um, is the applicant willing to change the steps to concrete? Yes. That's good. Yeah. So you want to just make a motion and add that in there? Uh, you know, I, have my, I don't have the, the 
Here's the recommendation in front of me, so I, I, I'm happy to do so. But Just because of the, sure. <coughs> the uh, your catch, you get, to get credit for I it. Deserve <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. I get appearance in my, my, my prize's appearance in next month's minutes. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 1003 Bate Avenue. Uh, so I'm move approval for the application for said address in the Waverly Belmont Hillsborough Conservation Overlay District. Um, with staff recommendations and the additional condition that the um, stairs or the steps of the front porch um, called out as brick and concrete be changed to uh, or confirmed that they will be concrete steps. Okay. I'll second. Have a motion. Yes. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. So, um, 1404 Lillian. We'll return to this one. Uh, the applicant has not returned yet, but the applicant or the recommendation is favorable. Hopefully, they'll be all right with us proceeding. Uh, it is an application to demolish an existing house and construct a new house on the lot. The existing house bears resemblance to a Craftsman bungalow, which is, of course, a common house, uh, historic house type in the neighborhood. But this was actually constructed circa 1950, and this front porch is added. Uh, giving it the craftsman look. It is not a contributing structure uh, in the Lachlan Springs neighborhood and demolition meets the design guidelines. The proposed new house will be one and a half stories and will also have the form uh, and character very similar to a craftsman bungalow. Uh, the side gabled roof, the projecting full width porch, uh, square columns uh, are, are all typical craftsman features. Uh, the height and width and materials of the new house are compatible with surrounding historic houses and the overall form and character, as I said, is very appropriate for the neighborhood. Uh, one, uh, a few things to point out, but uh, one being that the siding is shown with a six inch reveal. Uh, typically, historic houses don't have siding wider than five inches, so staff recommends that the siding uh, have a reveal of five inches or less. Uh, as that's typical of the uh, historic houses. Uh, as you see, there's also a front gable dormer. Uh, that dormer is uh, originally proposed sitting with the front uh, stacked or aligned directly over the primary front wall of the first story below. Uh, typically, uh, dormers on historic houses are set back from the primary wall, uh, so staff recommends or would recommend that that is also stepped back two feet. Um, I'll just sum up now, uh, which simply, uh, like I said, staff recommends approval of the proposed demolition of a non-contributing house and constructing a new one, new one and one half story house with the following conditions, that the porch floor shall be consistent with adjacent houses uh, to be verified during construction that the front setback for the infill shall be the average of the adjacent buildings to be verified on site prior to construction, that the siding exposure shall not exceed five inches, and that the roof color, uh, windows, and doors uh, selections are approved by staff, uh, that the front dormer is set back two feet from the wall below, and also that the driveway uh, on the right side of the house shall not be shortened uh, currently it extends to the back of the house, so we just want to make sure that that condition uh, s remains. Uh, and that the proportion and rhythm of windows shall be typical of historic buildings with no large expanses. Uh, that would be by adding two, uh, sorry, by increasing the size of two windows on the left side of the house. Uh, to my knowledge, the applicant agrees to all of those conditions. Um, but they're not here. So. All right. I can answer any additional questions. <laughs> uh, in I case have a question about underneath the porch. It says brick or lattice. Have we approved lattice before? Uh, on, on, underneath the porch, yes. Um, it's maybe more common of um, Victorian houses to have that, but okay. you occasionally, uh, sometimes porches don't have a continuous, do not have a continuous foundation and lattice okay. can be used there. So that wouldn't be unusual from what we've done in the past? Mm, no, I don't believe so. Okay. The, the foundation that says smooth stucco finish or brick, 
assuming OPT is optional or option, would we, we approve a brick foundation? I guess on a, on a house of this style, that would be appropriate or not so much? Uh, typically, as long as there's a change in materials, that's the main one of the main things that we look for in, in a foundation. Um, I think, I, you know, certainly parged is appropriate in brick. It's not common on brick houses for a foundation, but for on a wood frame house, it may be. There's a, on the side of this, I don't know if I'm just not reading it on the front, it didn't look like the little bump for the stairs is depicted on the front elevation. And then it's showing a rail that kind of, or maybe it is, no, the headline is there. Very it's good. deceptive, but I think it is, it is there. We talked about this in drives through approved projects in the past. I can think on a bungalow, it's, it's especially critical, the width of, you know, the column base width, so sometimes people short, they come up a little short on the width of the of base of the column, and we're, we're nitpicking, but gosh, it, it really does look funny when those things aren't medium enough at the, at the base. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Sean. Um, so the applicant um, is not here. Um, but open public hearing, would anyone like to speak regarding this project? Okay, close public hearing. Have a motion? Move to approve staff recommendation of 1404 Lillian. Second. Second. Have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. Can I ask a general question, Chair? Can I just ask a general question? You sure can. Not this here, but Ben Mosley uh, reminded about the distance between you, the back of the house to the structure. I have a 20 foot in, in my head. When is that ap applicable? Or when do we apply that? For Mercury. an outbuilding, is that the? Yeah, uh, or a dadu. The italicized portion of the design guidelines uh, for dadu and outbuildings. It's not in the ordinance, but the italicized says that there should be a separation of 20 feet between the outbuilding and the back of the principal building. Is that what you're right? But then, some, but right now we had a situation where it was eight foot on the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. We just talked about it, eight yeah. to ten foot. It's it's one of those things where it, there there's rarely a reason someone can't meet the eave height requirements, the ridge height requirements, the square footage requirements. But it's often difficult to meet that twenty foot, mm -hmm. and so you have been much more lenient with that. Okay. So either a tree doesn't come down, or we had one where they were using an, an existing pad that was already there. So there's been various reasons where you have allowed that. That's sort of our italicized then is, is the 20 size. foot. Yes. So we, we make a designation or, or a decision, on, you know, based on that it's particular based on project. The of that size. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, collection of officers. Do we have a? Nomination for chair and vice chair. I'll start off with uh, chair. I nominate Brian Tibbs as the chairman. A second. Okay. Any others? Okay. All in favor? Uh, Aye. All opposed? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, do we have a nomination for vice chair? I would nominate Rose Cantrell. I'll second. Oh. Okay. <laughs> we have a. I Any other nominations for vice chair? Okay. Have, um, all in favor? Uh, all right. right. All opposed? Okay. Did you do Rose, you're now vice chair. <laughs> um, hey, God, there's a conspiracy up here. <laughs> <laughs> Adoption revised rules. Um, this, is, this is fortunately a pretty simple one, I think. Um, Chairman Tibbs recommended that the um, now that you've been voted in without your knowledge as vice chair, that the <laughs> <laughs> chair and vice chair serve for two years. Um, it, it made sense to me because if you're a new person, new in that position, you often haven't really kind of gotten your feet until it's almost time for you to leave. So that's up for you to vote for today. Right now it's one year. Again, this isn't the, your time serving on the board. This is just your time serving as the chair and vice chair. Um, so right now it's one year, and if you'd like, we can change the rules and rules of order and procedure to be two years. But that makes sense. Yeah, that way it can it really rotate. Yeah. It can rotate around, and the vice chair can have some experience at it. Mm -hmm. but, but I guess if you had an expiring term, that would mean the people that whose term expired in a year could not be eligible to fill the position. Mm -hmm. No, I think they would still be eligible. It's just you'd have to find someone else halfway through that 
term. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about that? I move that we change the uh, rules and procedures as so described. Second. Okay. Motion is taken. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. All opposed? Okay, motion carries. And one other thing I wanted to, to bring to your attention, um, I know it's really late because it's next week, but if anyone can go to the NAPC conference in Mobile, uh, we still do have a little bit of funding. We could probably pay for all or, or the vast majority of your expenses through our CLG grant and match. So if you want to head down to Mobile for the weekend, let me know. Um, there's also a training opportunity coming up in Franklin, Tennessee. You have email with all the details on that, the date and so forth. That's $25. Oddly, we don't have the funding for that. Uh, the funding is earmarked specifically towards NAPC conference. Um, so that's available to you as well. And that's a full day. And I think that's geared mainly towards legal issues. Um, several of uh, our staff will be attending. And I think at least one commissioner will be attending. So I know. Is that the Mobile one? Yeah. That one's in Franklin. It's Franklin. Worth, it's worth twenty-five dollars just to see the old old general down there. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> and as an architect, if you need some additional um, health, safety, and welfare credits, you can also receive those at that. Uh, All right, that sounds good. At the conference, yes. Remind me when that one is. That's next week. It's so mobile. it's mainly Thursday through no, no. Saturday. The Franklin. The one that's Franklin. further it's out. 19. Oh, it's NEPC conference is the one that offers the AIA and AICP credits. Okay. I'm not sure about Franklin. If, if nothing else, meeting is adjourned.